The Revenge of By the Numbers is brought to you by eSportsBet, the industry's leading crypto odds matrix. Did you know right now you can bet on World Cup matches too? You can actually bet on sports as well on the website. But they obviously have their classic first-time crypto deposit of 50% up to 200 USDT, whether that's for eSports or for sports. Chris is still very much in the round. Oh, Chris, he's found three. It's down to a two-on-two. No two. Chris, can he close this with an ace? Oh, my God. He gives him a chance to lead, so this CZ kill could be everything. Finally, Zeus, oh. he does something. Looking for a second, he connects it. Oh, and he gets a third as well. Surely he's not going to pull this off. Caldera, oh, the man, the myth, the beast. Zyru, no, no help, really, but he's still hitting shots. He's already got three. And four, and five, and no! All right, and after that sick intro, welcome everybody to another episode of Revenge of By the Numbers. First off, happy Thanksgiving, wherever you are in the world. It is the happy Thanksgiving. It is the Thanksgiving weekend. Lots of good food, lots of time spent with family and friends. So I hope you guys are having a good one and uh, there's plenty to be grateful for. We have a, a perfect, uh, beautiful tournament that's going on right now, uh, Counter-Strike wise uh, with Blast. We're going to be talking about that. There's a bit of news going on. But uh, first, before we get into the thick of things, Thorne, how you doing, man? You good? You have a good week? I'm all right. Here's what's funny. Normally, I would make some sort of quip about the idea, like, why would I be thankful for Thanksgiving? If anything, shouldn't I have wanted all those people to die out? Like, the natives just proved to be complete savages and all anyone. Shouldn't I want it to not work out? I mean, spoiler, if if that... All I'm saying is, if there was no Thanksgiving, it's possible Britain still might have the Suez Canal and global control. That's all I'm saying. So <laughs> what are we really being thankful for is all I'm saying. Are you well, under the assumption, are you, are you operating under the assumption <laughs> that you don't have global control right now? Okay, I see. Well, that. the joke is I don't really believe any of that stuff. Like, I don't, like for example, <laughs> as much as people talk like, like, hey, well, what you know, we saved the old asses in World War II. It's like, none of us were in World War II, mate. None of us. And also, none of us know what that was about. So but what I was going to say for real, though, is that's actually one of the few holidays that Americans have. I'm actually jealous of, mate, Thanksgiving. I actually think Thanksgiving is probably the best holiday that you have. Because here's the thing. Think about it, right? July the 4th, unfortunately, does get drawn too much into the whole geopolitics thing. And what do you still think of the country? Everyone knows Christmas a long time ago became a very cynical corporate holiday. Thanksgiving, actually, it's just the concept of family, get together with family and have a chill time. Like That's actually, like by the way, what things like Christmas used to be. So I, th I actually think that's one where even though we don't have it in the UK or Europe, I, I might just do like my own version of that. I think it's a pretty banger. Like I won't be able to get all my family around or whatever, but just my own personal inner circle. And it's a pretty cool idea. It's a pretty chill yeah. holiday, right? Nothing bad with that. Yeah, no, Thanksgiving kind of like it got <coughs> off, it got sidetracked for me because DreamHack Winter always lines up with uh, Thanksgiving. That's true. Yes. You know, so it's like when we were going to DreamHack Winters all the time, th that was it. You know, you're just not at Thanksgiving and then moved to Sweden full time and then, you know, all that. And it's just, oh, you must have missed tons of them then. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, no, used to like just, half your life. You must have missed them, right? At the, that's just right. It feels like it though. I mean, it really does. It's weird. But uh, yeah, so Thanksgiving now, it's, it is cool when you have your, when you get your group of friends together though and you start organizing like a dinner like that. We're trying to do one for Christmas as well where it's like all the lads get together, you know, have a big meal, just have a good time, get everybody together and spend time together. Cause that's really what it is about, you know? And that's, that's why um, I agree with you completely. You know, it's like, it is one of those, those festivals that I'm completely behind now because even the concept, it's like, not only just get together with family and friends, have a great meal, take the time to just, you know, sit down and enjoy each other's company, but also the, just the idea of trying to be grateful for things. You know, just trying it's to sit there isn't it? for a moment, be grateful for the fact that- You know, when I was young, dude, friends and I thought that was some sort of like, you know, like it's essentially just like some school mom just telling you, like, you're going to do this. Like, sure, and you yeah. think, why do you have to do it? What I realized is for real, I'm not joking. If you don't actually look at things in your life and feel gratitude for them, look, you don't have to be religious. You don't have to necessarily do no, it. Like you don't that have course. to associate with that. I mean, just be grateful for the fact that, like, you have those things in your life or the fact, even if they're things, by the way, that you worked hard to get, be grateful that it worked out and that the opportunity worked out. I actually think that is super important, dude, because I think if you don't do that, it's way too easy to sort of like be selfish about the things you have and go, like, I got these, you're all mine. And, and then that way you actually don't appreciate them. Mate. You sort of do just like it gives, it, you lose something from it in that sense. I agree. That's what's such a shame about the fact that like it, 
it's gotten sidetracked in the States in a sense, you know, because I grew up in Los Angeles where the whole, you know, I really got sidetracked. I saw it early on into just like, oh, well, you know, like you put it like the joke is at the beginning, right? All those those poor Indians and all the pilgrims and all that. Oh, they still like go on about that. That's not the point of the still whole holiday, is it? And they still try to make it about that and only about that so that you ignore the good or you get distracted from the good things about the holiday. I, you know, I, again, spending time with family yes. and trying to be grateful for things. It's like those are the core concepts of it. But because there was just that little shred that you could latch on to and focus on and draw your attention to. That's almost what it's what Thanksgiving's about now. And so, oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, you're not even. You're not paying, you know, it's been co-opted. It's. Been I'll, I'll tell you what gives you a clue that this is actually it could be a really awesome, like as you say, a festival, celebration, holiday, whatever you want to call it. The reason why you know it could be super powerful because essentially all it is, like I say, is everyone just go back, meet up with your true family, like people actually are close to you and a part of your inner circle, have an awesome time, and hopefully re reflect on how grateful you are to have those people. The way you know that is super powerful powerful dude is what you just described there because you know that became a famous thing i'd say the last like five years or so basically since a certain person got elected president of the united states you'll notice it became this thing they push on social media they say it for christmas but they especially say it for thanksgiving you know where they they try to impress on young walk people like when you go home don't just have yeah, dinner like start us. yeah by the way th that that's a clue right there here's the here's the breadcrumb there for all you there guys right that actually implies if you don't do that the effects are what we don't want. Like you'll have a communal feeling. You'll mm -hmm. do things similar. Like you'll think who gives a fuck about some nonsense in Washington. That's like my uncle over there. That's where you connect with him. Like the, all these things are the opposite of what they want. So I would say the good news is the great thing in the modern day about a lot of your enemies are because there's so many dumb people they've tricked. They're actually very transparent. They sort of just sort of tell you what the game plan is. If you just infer the opposite, you'll, you'll figure out what they mean. So the joke is the very fact they're so threatened by it. They try and tell you something stupid, like waste your time instead of having a love time like argue with your uncle about like political theory and a bunch of nonsense like that gives away the game that actually it's way more important to just forget all that nonsense it's all distraction and just actually get on with family because the real joke i think mate is i've even noticed this online i'll bring it back into esports it's one of the things that I found so annoying once I actually stopped reading all the tweets, you know, dude. Now that I don't read all the tweet replies, and I have no idea what people are saying about the industry and all the rest of it, I have, like, almost no resentment to almost any people in the industry. I'm sure some people are still being assholes and enemies of mine and plotting against me or just scrutinizing everything. Because sure. I don't read it. I just don't care, mate. Like, it actually makes me think, look, I'm not going to get all soft and go the other way and go, oh, come by out. Welcome out. I mean, spoilers. I've already seen some things on the list here that I'm going to open people's asses over. But anyway, <laughs> exactly. well, I will say, to say, like, but at the same time, though, game. at the same time, though, I do now think, kind of like I did a few years back, unless someone's done something ridiculous, like I'll tell you an example, some like Sir Scoops or Slasher, they're obviously over the line because they have done ridiculous things to like actively try and harm my career or say outrageous things about my character. That's unacceptable. But if someone is just basically some, like some annoying idiot, like and it's just that they're on some stupid political angle, I'm actually going to be like the bigger person in that sense. Like I'm going to be the uncle who's just going to sort of be like, let's just shut the fuck up about that and have a good time. Like, because that's what eSports should also be in the industry. Industry, right like unless people have a reason to directly combat each other why are we letting like stupid external stuff m make people who otherwise would be really cool and have a great like i have a relationship rapport maybe even appear on why are we just letting that divide us it's so whack in it maybe because i mean i think that well i it just doesn't seem like they ha they see this uh, see the situation the same way as you do right they're not willing to be the bigger man and so oh, that's true that's that's yeah. that that's that constant discussion though isn't it right where it's like one side tries to hold to principle or to morals and then the other side is just like oh you're holding to those good now i know the rules of the game and i'm going to go ahead and play around that game right um, and that always feels like it's just this constant thing where it's like, okay, but in order to win, then you need to eliminate the principles or you need to eliminate the morals and stoop to their level. That's what they say, right? Like, oh, stoop to their level. But then at that point, you're all, you're all rolling and shit and Absolutely. it all falls apart. Yeah. So it's like, what are you fighting for at the end of the day at that point? Right. I, it, it is that conversation, but I get where you're, I get where you're talking about in the sense that this, this is kind of coming back to that, to that point you were talking about last week, I think, or the week before where you, you just, you just, if you sit on the coast, or if you sit on the riverside long enough, you're just going to see the uh, the bodies of your enemies flow by. And uh, especially if you happen to be keeping receipts, which I know that you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the joke is, Sam, like, I'll tell you what I'm thankful for. I'm just thankful for all the gifts the internet just just, just, just bestows, bestows upon me on a daily basis, Sam, like, because, yeah, obviously what you're referring to is I woke up today like, oh, nice morning. Cup of old Joe. Mm, let's get go. What's going on in the newspapers today? <laughs> Jeeves. Frankie Ward announced host of <laughs> PSL Impact. 
what's this? Seven, seven, seven. Ding, 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 ding. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I've told people in the past. I, you know what's mad, Sembler? I actually was going to let that go for real if she never worked for ESL again. If she'd never worked, because she hadn't remember since they joined with the Saudis and were bought ESL and Face It by him, she had actually mm-hmm. technically never worked with the ESL or Face It in any capacity, as far as I know. Now, if yeah. that was actually true, if somehow she had held, I would actually say fair play. You know what? I don't really totally buy it. Like I do think, if for like, for, I'll give you a credit as well. Also skipped a major. That's a big deal. I don't know if she could have been hired for it. I don't know what her relationship with, but I, I imagine it was possible in that scenario. If she'd have really done it, look, I wouldn't like give her like mad props. Like all you did is not work for people you said would kill your friends. But that's at least something or something. That would be some level of commendation would be appropriate for that. But this is just whack, mate. Because here's the dumbest thing about it all. It's all come full circle, mate. Remember, it's not even some like she's working the major. If you work in the major, right, the angle would be what's well, one of the biggest events in the calendar. Like, you know, I'm an esports professional. I don't want to miss like giant events it's actually in some ways more whack that she's just doing that female tournament because the joke is she can't like the female tournament is the fucking flame assembler and then she is the moth and like but frankly they're all saudis over there who uh, mistreat women no but the but the flame though but look at the beautiful flame though but surely if i get next to the beautiful flame i'll be nice and warm no frankie if you go towards the flame though they'll burn you alive like they hate women remember no but the flame if i can just get to the flame like give me a break so the joke is she's wrecked herself guys basically Frankie Spoiler is working with ESL who are owned by the fucking Savvy Gaming Group via the whatever it was, Public Investment Fund, which is managed in a hands-on capacity by the fucking leader of Saudi Arabia. So essentially, the same Frankie who came out and not only decried herself having worked with the Saudi like f- sports fund or whatever it was when it was the games up borders thing. But then obviously most famously, she called out blast over the neon sponsorship and said, I oh, should never work with them again if they were sponsored by it. And then when I pointed out, but well, you just worked with the Saudis like a few months earlier, her comeback was yes. And you know, we need to like learn from this, not to work with people who would kill our friends. That was literally how she phrased it. And even worse, are you ready for how she absolutely wrecked herself somewhere? In theory, she could always still have plausibly denied that it was, about the Saudi specifically. Like she could have said, oh, I meant specifically the Neon Project because, you know, like the Neon Project did entail some other weird sure, things. Like that. Neon. Yeah, yeah. You know, all that shit. But here's where she wrecked herself, Samla. In the same tweet where she said, and let's not learn, let's learn not to work with people who would kill our friends. She just linked to like a Wikipedia article about countries that have like bad LGBT rights. And on the fucking map, I'm not joking, guys, go look. On the map, one of the countries filled in on the picture of the tweet that she put is Saudi Arabia. Chef's kiss because they fully <laughs> own ESL, the company she's not working for. And the genius of this summer, I'm going to make one key point here and then we're just going to drop and go to the next thing, right? But here's the one point I want to make because I think it's a really key way to frame this. I'll do all video about her. Don't worry about that. I, I was always something. Listen, in this scenario, by the way, it's not even about her. It's about, I'm going to do the video to show what virtue signaling is like because this is the ultimate example of it where you virtue signal, you've gotten all the benefit and upside from it. And now you're going to. Cast aside the thing that you were getting props for and get all the upside of of not following those principles. Like, you just double dip all over the place. Here's the point I'm going to make, Samla. It's a really shrewd one. So here's what happened, right? Frankie has said everything right about supporting women and about how she loves women. She loves equality and inclusion and diversity. But in her actions, she has chosen to work with people who murder, beat, oppress women, do all sorts of shit, treat women like second-class citizens. So her actions are actually that she doesn't support women, but her words say she does. Now, let me contrast her with a different figure in the industry. You know, Carlos, right? His team, G2, just won that game changers tournament in Valorant. He, did. he has now, and he also built that team around Giuliano and CSGO and Zazzle. So he has made some of the most legendary female teams ever. If you were to look at men who've had a big influence over like female esports, he'd be one of the biggest in the last few years. So those are his actions. Now let's look what he did wrong. A couple of slightly edgy tweets. So the message the esports industry sends you is this. It doesn't matter whether you actually support women or ever do anything to help or hurt women. You can even hurt women, by the way. Just don't ever tweet an opinion that women in esports don't like. That's the only le- That's the only conclusion we can take from this whole thing. If you put the two stories together, the only conclusion basically is you better tweet what I like. It's not even about if you help them or not. That's the maddest part, I still think. Because they don't think... I mean, you know, on a smaller level, it's the same thing happened to me, mate. Like, the joke is, I have helped countless women in, like, a tangibly provable manner. And people... 
still act like, yeah, but what about this tweet? So it's like, so then, so now I know your hierarchy of values. A tweet you don't like is number one. Now, spoiler, everyone, because of a certain president, knew all they cared about was tweets. But like, this just really puts it in your face, mate. Like, how can it just be about tweets, guys? We can't run the world off tweets. It's about your actions, of course. Well, it's because they're conflating tweets with actions. That's the thing. It's much easier to talk about something than to actually do oh, something. Of course, yeah. That's always the, the get out online. That's why you shouldn't actually, you know, it's like a helpful tip there is that you shouldn't say what you're going to do ahead in advance. You can, you know, it's like just, just do, and then your actions will yeah, show absolutely. it. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I have, um, I have, I like, we have, again, a reminder guys, just in case you're wondering, we, like, we keep all of the uh, links to what we're discussing in the description below. So there is, like I said, you know, thorne has been keeping receipts. And so he did actually make a, th a, th uh, a thread, a chain, a, a, a tweet chain on Twitter with the map with the screen cap and also with the screen cap. This was the one that I was, that I thought that I thought that was interesting, right? Because you, the last tweet you say, remember that oh, Frankie yes. wants to get people yes. to call each other out. And that's why I don't, you know, that's why it's like, yeah. Oh, okay, you're going to love this dude. Do you want to know the context of that? <laughs> if you check the timestamp, you'll notice that's from 2018. Because here's what's genius. You're also going to learn a very key point. That's why I said I'm going to make a video. But the point of making the video about Frankie, it's actually going to be sort of like an, an like anatomy of what like a virtue signal is like. Because what you're going to find somewhere is this. It's the same shit you've seen a million times with cancel culture. Oh, no, don't, don't cancel me. I'm one of the good ones. I, I can't be canceled. Like, so then the entire principle was just a scam. The joke yes. was all my enemies should be destroyed and all my friends should get no punishment. Because if you check the time stop there, Samuel, what she was responding to was her calling me out. And what she was explaining there was that she thinks it's really important that we all publicly call each other out over any minor of, like she's actually on some like struggle session shit, homie. Let, where, like, let me read the, not tweet. Even privately, let me read the tweet. Yeah, so go on. Hit me with it. Can hear it. Like, so this is Frankie Sweet. Refreshingly, there's loads of commentators, commenters, on the original thread calling him out, him being you. Also, there are a few of us who do point out this behavior isn't acceptable. It's just our voices aren't as amplified. I'm trying to get people to call each other out respectfully in, in brackets more often. So that is the thing where it's just like, okay, now if this is if this is the kind of culture that you want to foster, Absolutely, where yeah. it's okay to call people out and to hold people accountable, right? Well, then it's just desserts in a sense, right? Where the, the, sure. the chickens come home to roost eventually and here we are. Also, think how nuts this is, Samler. Remember, you remember this. When I pointed out, like, as soon as the Saudis bought ESL, that if anyone like Frankie, she was always my go-to example, if any of them work from, they're just hypocrites, right? Dude, I don't know if you saw this. Multiple times she has had, like, mini tantrums on Twitter where she's sort of saying, like, why do people keep calling me out? I haven't even worked with them yet. Because, one, you set the precedent, like Samler just said, that you want people to be called out. And, two, you had worked with them in the past and set what was an obvious precedent that was going to be called. This bill was going to be called to be paid at some point in time. And the joke is, this is how outrageous a human this person is, Samler. She simultaneously wants to get mad at people. Like, why are you all calling me out? I'm not even going to work with them yet. Oh, what's that? A few months later, I do work with them. Well, what's the point then? She's the ultimate, like, have your cake and eat it person, mate. It's so ridiculous. Like, you, so now you get props for not working with them. Like, the joke there, Samler, is that at this point in time, she wants, like, a humanitarian medal for all the days of the year she doesn't work with the Saudis. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? At least over 300 days a year, I don't even work with people who kill my friends. Oh, dude. <laughs> Give, Give me a break, break. I know. Give me a break. Here's your medal. It's uh, that is the the mad the mad thing, and especially when it comes to this impact league as well. You know, we're there. I I noticed now looking at it where it's like you got Heku on there as well, who was also advocating for uh, trans uh, women playing in the league as well. So then it gets into a question of whether or not are we actually having a league that supports women, or are we going to be going down this path where it gets corrupted as well, and you're going to have men competing in this league alongside the women. Whereas you know, the, I mean, what's the point of calling it a, a league for women if that's not going to be if it's not going to be held to you if you're not going to follow that standard so frankie getting involved there i mean all of them are getting involved in this kind of league where we saw that with the game changers one on riot as well where it was quite a few trans women playing in that in that tournament and that was supposed to be the top teams in the scene really interesting to see how that's panning out as quickly as it is but then here as well in impact that's the same sort of scenario so it's because the thing that doesn't make sense, Samla, this actually does go back to the point you originally made, which you got attacked for, which was the principle that they build that league, the ESL Impact League. Uh, remember, they didn't make it like Game Changers, which is explicitly supposed, as far as I know, involve like, I think Game Changers actually does intentionally involve like mixed rosters or something. I'm not quite sure on how that works. I know the, the okay. G2 team was a female team, as far as I know. G2 but was I, a female team, and they I won think that had so. some component where, I don't know if like, you had to be non binary or something, like that. I'm not sure, but they, they definitely had it as well. Here's the problem, Samla. Your point about 
what the ESO Impact League was. They implied it was necessary because of toxicity that women experience online. That was the primary reason, like impetus for why the league needed to exist. And as I'll point out for the millionth time, every person who doesn't know esports and thought that meant this was the first ever female league, you counter signaled, mm -hmm. you know nothing about this topic, shut your fucking mouth and listen to the people who do know about this topic and the history of this topic. So when they made the league, and remember, as I'm saying, there were already leagues for women. These already existed. But what they were sort of saying almost is, we need to put more money in because they're getting so much toxicity, which obviously was the point you were against, right? Now the implication, if you do another logical analysis of this scenario, as you're seeing with who can now play, is it's not even the idea that men and women are different similar. It's only heterosexual men who are evil. That's the That's conclusion it. to take. Yes. Isn't it? Am I, am I wrong? Because their implication is if you're anyone else who then says in this scenario, like you're with I'm us, really a, I'm really a woman or whatever, then suddenly you can't ever. The logic is, by the way, so remember by the original premise, you could never be toxic to women. So now we can let you into our community and our tournament. You can play in it now. I don't get that part, by the way, because that's, that part doesn't make any sense at all. Like, the joke is that argument, like, defeats itself, really, because essentially the argument's similar. This might like, sound mad, but what they're doing with the SL Impact is the same principle as, like, a women's prison or a women's shelter or something. The premise goes like this. There needs to be a segregated area for women because they're vulnerable. You're like, okay. But then anyone else who says they're a woman can also come, well, then what are we doing? Which is it? You know what I mean? Like, doesn't that defeat the purpose? I'm actually trying to find to me, it this kind again. of seems it's like really it interesting because the, the reason why I bring Heku up is because I watched a podcast and this is old. This is you old said she now. was on like the Nart Out Here one or whatever. With exactly, Anders she was that, on right? the Nart Out Here one where they had something like 15 women who were competing in the and Anders for some reason and <laughs> Anders was there. <laughs> just the way he's just there, like a little. <laughs> <laughs> and Heku was there, and Heku was the only one that I really remember, you know, taking up. That it was like a five, like okay. out of a two hour long podcast, a controversial topic, or what should be a controversial topic, like trans women joining this exclusively women league, right? Took up about five minutes of that two hour podcast with all of these pro female players on it. And the person who did the majority of talking during that five minutes was Heku. And everybody else is just smiling and nodding along. What was their angle? Do you know, remember like the gist of what she was like? Come on. You've got all of these pros here. They're all on board with this. They're all, nobody, nobody has even a question, something, you know, that they may want to say about how, like, maybe this goes against what the principle of the league and what what this is about and giving more opportunity. No, no, no. Everybody is on the same page. And it's at, at that point you'd realize, okay, well, they clearly don't feel safe to talk about it. Yes. Right. Because of course the, the obvious implication is that if they do raise a question, even a question, they could risk run, getting yeeted off of their team oh, of and not could, being able yes. to compete anymore. And considering yes. this impact league leads to uh, actual paychecks for some of these uh, for, for some of these teams, they actually oh, get sure. a paycheck now, a steady paycheck, which is why they may not be willing to uh, to, to say anything. Now you got dough on the line, you got money on the line, and now you're gonna have everybody just nodding along and saying yes, okay, fine. I mean, of course, it, it really is it, it really is wild, but. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, I mean, it's fun to mention Giuliano because again, this is, uh, this is now, you know, used to be on the CS side now over in the Valorant side, but at least, you know, Giuliano, uh, got work done, you know, G2 Giuliano, they, they really got work done and, uh, and it's a full female team that actually won that Valorant tournament. So congratulations. Oh to man, them. let's be real. Giuliano has to be a contender for like best female competitor in the history of esports. Now she she's done it in be. two different games, guys. Like yeah. as much as you might want to say like, oh, but it's a smaller scene and the games are sort of similar. Like it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, she's still had to beat all the women who play Valorant and play in that tournament. And, yeah. and that's all you need to know. Like I know people did take it too far when they were like naming on Katie forever about that but the joke is of all the like women who actually could have beaten like an actual real male pro she's in that class like if people don't know i i actually do think similar for real i'll make a serious point here i actually do think people like juliano could play in what people will dub the male scene even though it's just the scene of top teams the problem is though similar i do get the feeling she'd have to be on like a smaller team or like a tier three team or something so i understand why you wouldn't do it it's better to why not just be the king of the female scene it makes more sense right so i actually think the sad thing is as much as I'm congratulating her, she is an example of what you made your point about on Twitter, which is like if you offer a scene that sort of essentially incentivizes you to stay in the small pond, you always will, won't you? Because I think she actually, if, I've seen enough of her play, but she seemed like half decent. She could have been at like a not a top pro level, let's not get silly. But she could play for like some tier three team, in my opinion. Sure. I mean, but that's the problem again, is when you have these sorts of uh when you have this isolated league where there's quite a bit of money involved now where you can make a steady paycheck. Why, why are you going to potentially take the risk of, why are you going to lose that paycheck by going and trying to compete with, with tier two, tier three, tier four teams online 
where you have to grind like a motherfucker to have any chance at all at anything. And then the paycheck isn't guaranteed. Those guys have to go hard before they're making any kind of real money. And that's, you know, you get to tier three, maybe tier two, then you start making some decent money in tier two, maybe. And then, you know, you get into tier one and that's the mega bucks. But you have to go so it, it is such a difficult process to be able to get within range of making any kind of real money in the pro scene. Oh, of course it is, yeah. So when you create an artificial little bubble over here where you have a decent chunk of prize money that's up for grabs and also a salary for teams where they can get sponsorship and all that sort of thing, why would you risk that? It's it's the point that I made originally. One of the one of the points that I made originally was you know it's all of the incentives point towards you staying in that female league and never actually going into the mainstream and fighting there. So, but I mean, not to. Not I've got to a question for you. I want. I want to spin some of the takes. This is in like true by the numbers fashion. It's a question people won't expect me to ask you. So I'll ask you though. One area I actually think you were really misrepresented in all that stuff at the end of last year, and I think my position is beyond stupid. I'll be trying to portray me. It's the exact opposite. Is I actually get the vibe similar. If I looked at who you are today and what your current like principles in the world are, right beyond the abstract discussion of like can women compete with men and you know like how would they improve if we take all that out of the equation for a second we just say right i today similar want a tournament where like women who were good the best of the women can compete somewhere isn't it in, in some ways better man i'm assuming you acknowledge as well they wouldn't be able to make it the top male end of the scene right now right isn't it actually in a way as long as they don't do it on like disingenuous grounds how they made it isn't it actually cool that there's a, a, a women's circuit of their own that they can compete yes. in? And i think they should have their point. own space yeah but it's on me. It's like I've I've I failed to communicate. And some I also, people didn't want to hear it as well. Though, let's be real. I, I know what you mean. To, but I needed some to make a chain hear. out of the tweets, and instead of and instead of that, I just made each, each individual tweet. So some tweets took off, and everybody saw them. The ones where I was being sarcastic for the most part, and then any of the 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 tweets that actually explained the position a little bit more, those got just overlooked because it's not hot. It's not what's taking off or whatever, right? But my like I'm ne I was never against female competition at at any point in it. I was against the narrative that they set up that it's because of toxicity and blah, 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 all this other, but you know, it's not their fault. It's, it's everything else around yes. them and they're doomed to fail. I was against that narrative because I feel like that already gives you, gives women a set of excuses to, to, to it's setting them up for fail for future failure. It's not saying like, get out there and get after it and earn it and work. And you know, all, all of these positive narratives that really will get you to get results. It was always like, it was, it's already setting you up for failure. Like, Oh, well, don't worry. You know, like the world's harsh and it's against you and all that. Right. So already, I did. I hated that narrative, and also I hated the idea that that already at the time it sounded like there was going to be there were there, that they were already going to open themselves up to this sort of situation now where they have trans women that are playing with women, and and it's like I'm. Just, it didn't take long for that to happen, and that was the other thing where I was really uh, I'm set on that where it's like okay if you're going to have a, a, a league for women then you have to keep it a league for women. Uh, because for whatever reason, now we have two decades worth of evidence that shows that for whatever reason, women and men can't compete at the same level right now. We don't know why yet. We haven't put our finger yet on it. Is it physical? Is it uh, environmental? What is it? But for it whatever factor, reason, yeah. after two decades of esports, we can see that right now, at least that gap is not closing. So if you if you're going to have a league on its own just for women, then you have to keep it just for women because we're already seeing the the men who can't hack it in the in the in the main scene. Who are then going to go over there and compete where they should be in a mixed team in the in the male scene they should be in a mixed team over there instead because of that because again of those incentives that i was talking about right you're going to have grifters that are going to come in because hey easy money it's it's easier than the money that you had that you can earn in the mainstream and so if you if you have access to this little niche over here and you can just say like oh i i i, I fit certain criteria and I'm going to go ahead and get into this into this little niche where there's quite a bit more easy money to be gained by comparison to the mainstream. Yeah, of course. People, some people are going to do that. And so again, and I think that's detrimental for the women. By the way, just to league. clarify, I think that's unfair for the women. Sam I mean, crucially, the phrasing he says there is some people. He's not saying that every person who claims that. Yeah, no, I'm not saying obviously, that but he's pointing out this is quite a valid point to make. It's like when we make conflict of interest arguments. We're pointing out when you open the door, or you set a certain precedent. It could be abused, is the point, right? Yes, precisely. It's not calling everybody a grifter. Yeah, of course. It is saying that there are grifters out there, oh, and to think otherwise is naive. Yes, and it, I think it's unfair to put uh, to put uh, the women in that uh, in that position because I think you know female competition, shh, absolutely, go for it. You know, like build the scene, build the stars. I still don't know why Hafu doesn't get more attention, right? Because she was out there, you know, just competing sure. and getting after it. You know, she's a star as far as I'm concerned. 
I remember her. I mean, I was casting her Bloodline Champions tournaments back in the day. She was doing WoW before that, Hearthstone afterwards. I mean, she's a savage. She's a beast. It is possible, but you have to get out there. You have to build Oh, man, I'll tell you what's sad. This ties in again to my point about Carlos. This is where people don't know what Carlos did for female esports, mates. Why do you think that G2 Gozen team is so popular? I, you've, you'll have seen their Twitter. You follow some of those people from back they in the day. Skits. They do it. Because they, they do, do all they do the G2 of style. Of Carlos yeah. taught them how to do the G2 style and got them all involved in literally, by the way, something women never do. Trash talking even. You know when they do those videos like the Guild Esports one where they had like a trash kind of bag or whatever. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. That stuff, by the way, like the joke is I don't even watch those tournaments. Like I don't, first of all, mm -hmm. I don't watch Valorant much anyway. I definitely don't watch Game Changers, right? But the joke is I've seen loads of their Twitter skits. I thought they were quite funny actually. They're like Petra and Mimi seem fucking hilarious. They have a great rapport. Like what Carlos showed you there again also is like you can market yourself beyond just the game. Spoiler, that's a part that I don't get why people haven't figured out anyway, by the way, because that's also, that's always how esports operate. Like for example, in many different games, NA isn't the best, is it? But you'll always have no, some big NA have personality. Streamers. Yeah, you'll always have some guy who's got like the Idra personality or some fucking double lift type character. You can transcend your scene. So I also think there's another thing that Carlos did for women's esports. Like he actually sort of gave them some of the secret sources how you had market beyond just you placing in the server, you know. Absolutely. I mean, he like it's it's interesting that you mentioned NA because I mean that was that was Hiko, that was Tarek, that was all those guys shroud, you know, like the big streamers. Knowing Hiko himself, he was really on top of creating a platform and uh, sure. giving as many opportunities for sponsors to uh, to to sell as possible. So not as only far as I know, it's part of why left Cloud Nine, by the way. I Sorry, believe what I believe part of why he left Cloud Nine was something like he wanted sort of like more personal agency, and they wanted to sort of go the route where they just plaster everything over your account. Yeah, I think that was actually part of why. Yeah, probably. Well, actually, probably was. I wouldn't be surprised. Hiko was way ahead of his time. Yeah, and then and then you had the others come along. You know, the Shroud and Tarek and all those guys. You know, Skadoodle, like the, the they got into streaming. <coughs> same thing, but um, it, there there are definitely different ways to market it, and this definitely. I don't think playing. Playing the victim card is attractive. It's whacking it on all. It's whack. It's like a weak thing where yeah. it's just like, okay, cool victim. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. And then you're just going to get the simps that are going to come over and try and, you know, get like, I don't know, pay attention to you for that reason. But if it, if instead you're making it something funny, something cool, your yes. personality, yes. you're showing something I can relate with or be like, oh, yeah, cool. I want to be more like that. You know, like, dude, she's hitting headshots everywhere. That's sick. Like flashy plays. That's that sort of stuff. If you're showing me that, like, this is something cool that I want to be a part of. It's not some victim thing. It's like, oh, no, this is badass. It's a totally different narrative, and it changes everything, like you say. I mean, I I only know the G two guys, the G two, uh, well, the G two guys, interchangeable G two girls, right? The um, uh, the Gozen team because of that, because of the yes. social media. Obviously, Giuliano comes from a Petra. You know, a couple of them come from the CS scene beforehand. But if but like you, I'm not watching any Valorant stuff, but I do see that stuff pop up on my Twitter every now and again. Yes. And it's funny to see. It's cool to see, and it's like, okay, cool, yeah, Giuliano's still going, right? So, yeah, it's it's just that's one of those things where it really is unfortunate uh, to to see. Uh, how, how things are going and how things have gone. And I hope that it, it changes for the better going forward. Like and, go on, people man. like Frankie could be the, could like the thing is, is that people like Frankie could be uh, the voice of reason, right? They could try and make that bridge, that gap. They could, in there's, theory. there's redemption yeah, in possible theory. at all times, right? Like sure. they, they could, but uh, you know, I guess that's why, you know, if you set yourself up to, if you set yourself up <laughs> with a tweet like that, Frankie, you know, like, it's like, okay, well then we're going to have to, uh, we're Here's the problem, Sandler. Even though I know you just mean abstractly, it, it sounds like we're in like fucking whatever, like the, it was like, the, I think it was like the end of the second movie, Lord of the Rings, you know, in the Twin Towers, where the whole thing's about like, obviously Frodo's like, no, like Gollum can be redeemed or whatever. I'm just like, Sam, I'm just like, get him out, get him out. I'm like, <laughs> exactly. That's the relationship dynamic. And then what, we're going to find out that we needed her all along. Yeah, exactly. She was the one. She, she <laughs> tries to grab the ring at the end. And that's what saves us all, exactly. Exactly. She tries to grasp for esports itself and gets denied. By the way, I'll even say as well, it's just a good opportunity again if people don't know my position. I have a very simple way I explain it. I think actually, by the way, the sad thing about the timing of when I've gotten fucked by all this nonsense that will now follow me forever that I hate women and have said loads of misogynistic things, absolute nonsense, yeah, of course. Mad. And which again, like I say, goes counter to my actual life and career. So all I'll say is that's why I don't worry about it anymore, dude. Because the people who actually care take you five minutes on YouTube to find out that's wrong. So if you don't care to do that, then you probably weren't a good faith actor anyway, in my opinion. You probably had your own reasons for being against me. So what I'll say is this: I think I've actually found I've 
sort of cut the Gordian knot. I've found the ultimate way to explain to the kind of people that go on Reddit and do make the comments every time, like, but why are women getting a league? Why don't they just compete with men? Here's the, I've found the best way to explain it ever. Okay. So I'll give you the CSGO example. And what I'll do is I'll take it out of being about men and you'll suddenly immediately understand. So I'll give you two examples. One's an old school esports example. Do you remember back in StarCraft 2 when that was the biggest game in the world? And obviously in StarCraft 2, Koreans are far and away the best country, like, per top player and ranking, etc. And so what happened was Koreans got so dominant that, like, the best example ever was, I remember one year, I think it was, like, 2013 or something, my mate Naniwa was still one of the best Western players, right? And when he qualified to BlizzCon, Semler, he qualified as, like, the 16th player. The other 15 players were Koreans, and he lost in round one of the tournament. Like, that's how much Koreans dominate. So what they did, if you remember, with WCS, even though I actually was against it, was they region-locked. What they did was they had WCS America. And look, yep. there were still loopholes. Like, if you were port and you were going to university in america and you had like a full green card yeah then you could play but it meant that no one else could like you couldn't be like you know just some random mg cord s player and do it so it did keep your regional up right now i used to argue against that because my premise was esports is just competition so like why should that korean guy be denied the money and also sure, why should i basically just let some random american guy who's going to take it instead why should he get the money but what i didn't realize was this that's only if you're coming from my position of like only the ultimate person in the game deserves money that's like the purest perspective so what i would say is this here's the counter-strike example you know when all the flashpoint stuff happened and famously ESL took those EPL slots from the small NA teams and then caused a mixture of Flashpoint not working out and then NA teams going to Valorant meant all the top NA orgs died out and eventually we got to a like now like there is no NA scene and there's barely any tournaments like there's the IM Dallas tournament that's about it right and then the small lands is all you have left if someone said tomorrow assembler I'm going to make a new NA circuit. It's going to be mainly for NA players. Maybe I'll let the odd foreign team in, but it's mainly about building up the NA scene. I want to build up like the tier two and tier three levels, get them good so that the top team could then potentially go, you see what I'm doing with this example, and one day compete in like an IM with the Europeans, right? If someone said that, now, if my argument against that similar goes, yeah, but those NA players aren't the best players though. So why do they, the person could easily counter it by just going, I want to support NA players though. That's the counter. You, they don't have. They don't make the same argument. They're not saying this is about the best. They're saying in my particular case, I want to encourage any time. I'm, maybe I'm American. Maybe I enjoyed the history of American esports. That's a great argument to do it. So what I would say is, if you're all going like, but why are these women? Because in the same ways we have NA only tournaments. In the same way we have tournaments that are just for, like I'll give you an example. Right now they've got that tournament going to the CCT thing where it's for like lower tier teams all across Europe where they're all regionalized and all this stuff like. That's a perfectly fine endeavor. It's different from the purest approach of just the best person in the world wins the money. It's more like a, a, a specific way to try and build up certain seats. So I don't have any problem with that at all, mate. And then the final detail, I've mentioned it a million times, a lot of people aren't aware still, is none of the budget comes from the same pile. There's the other angle that it would be. If I knew that the major in CSGO, random example here, should be like 2 million, but they took half a million out to put in the ESL Impact League, then yeah, I would be like, what the fuck? So you mean like Simple can't win that money because he's not famous, you know? But if it, if I know that essentially the money to the Impact League just wouldn't exist in esports, then I also have no problem at all, do I? Because we're not losing anything. You're just gaining an extra tournament. And whether you want to watch it or not, like, Swallow, I'm not going to watch it, but that's fine. I don't want it to not exist because I'm not going to watch it. So I actually think that's the best way to explain it is take the gender part or the sex part out of it. We're all fine with someone choosing to just build up as part of the scene they appreciate or they want to see more of. So it's the same concept, but in this case, they want more women to play. I just hope uh, in this specific case with uh, with the female league, the impact league that's going on right now, I just hope that they get a bit more fortunate with their timing uh, going forward because they're oh, running, they're like... literally running right now their, their championship or whatever, their, their finals. And it's the same weekend as Blast. That is a mistake, We just yes. had a free weekend yes. after the major. But I, what I'm assuming is happening is because ESL runs both of those. ESL ran Rio and ESL also runs Impact. There must have been some, some interchange uh, between uh, the ESL employees as to who handles what, right? And so I guess ESL needed a week off you know, after the major and all that hard work, you know, they needed a week off before they could do the ESL yeah, yeah. Impact League uh, thing. But then that also means that then, once again, the females are competing with the males for viewership and everybody's making big, such a big deal out of VCT or the the the, the game changers thing for uh, for Valorant. But if you look at it, they, they, they put it on the weekend after the major. So no competition, no big CS tournament, no Valorant tournament, no nothing to compete with. They pretty much had a wide open weekend. And um, 
well, that, I mean, that's the main point. Like they had a wide open weekend. There was nothing to compete with. Whereas it feels like with the CS, uh, with the CS side of things. So yeah, if there's nothing to compete with, you're going to break records. You're going to have, a, you're going to get more viewers than you would normally get because you're not competing with a major CS tournament or anything else. So it really sucks to see for this ESL impact league that they have to compete with blast where it's, you got phase, you got Navi, you have all the big, you know, by the way, playing. by what you're saying, it sounds to me like actually a very logical thing they should do is what, if you remember, we play did like two years ago or whatever, where they just ran it. Like, well, it was last year when you did it. It's when they just ran it during the player break for yeah. poor counter strike. Like why not do that when all the men you have, have like to two do weeks it. Off. You're going to have to the do joke something is, like that. That's when someone might watch. Like if there's no mm-hmm. other counter strike being played and you have a big lance, so people will shoot in. Yeah. Of course. That's, so I, I hope that ESL makes a, yes, make like a agreed. tries to change it up in some way next year where it's like maybe during the holidays or something like that or during, you know, maybe it's like your 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 tournament uh, your tournament schedule doesn't run neck and neck with the male tournament schedule. You can be flexible in in your uh, in your um, in your timing. So I, I hope that they make a little bit uh, they make some schedule changes uh, going forward to try and get better viewership numbers for the for the for the Impact League because Right now, the Impact League, in terms of viewership, is 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 struggling. Right, they're not. What was really it at? What sort of numbers? numbers? I had a tab up here. Oh, I actually, I still have it. Um, let's see. So they aren't there. Uh, the The peak that they had last one last time was ESL Impact League season one, where they peaked at one hundred and ten thousand viewers and had a million hours watched over thirty five hours. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, right? That was also with a Gallus, I think, who was streaming. There was a Brazilian right. team doing well. They got a bit of Gallus in there. Right. Uh, I mean, the Brazilians are doing well again. So. Hopefully uh, they'll they'll kind of get a similar thing, but uh, we don't know what the numbers are looking like yet for the season two finals that are happening right now. But uh, and on average, you know, depending on the region, on average they they kind of average around sixty seventy thousand uh, hours watched for EU in North America and then South America. I, again, I think because probably Gallus or some kind of like maybe if he pops in at any point with his viewership, the the spike happens because they have two hundred and one thousand hours watched for the South American division this season. So. It's like, but it's, it's, it's still, it still feels pretty low, you know, in comparison to some of the, some of the other products out there. So I feel like when you have, when you have like numbers like these, you're really going to have to get smart about when you're actually running the tournament because running it at the same time as blast is just a, a farce. It's just, it's, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're not going to, you're really hurting your chances of, of in, improving the product via v, uh, viewership. How do you sell sponsorship if you're not really setting yourself up for success on the viewership front? So I hope that that changes in the future and that the, and that ESL impact actually, or ESL, you know, try to try to alter some stuff to get better viewership going for this league. Cause again, it, again, to reiterate, it's not that I want the league to fail. I think that there should be a female league out there. If the, if the females want to have a league, then fucking a go for it, build it up, but just set it up for success. Don't, don't say that you're doing something and then not go through to make it as good as it could be. That, that I guess that's the thing, right? Cause I mean, I guess you could say, but like, oh yeah, but we're doing this tournament. Like, look, you know, look, we're doing this tournament, but the, the tournament is janky as fuck and it's and it's overlapping with a bunch of male tournaments and you're just not going to get the viewership for it that, that's a bit of a shame so, i've got an obvious angle which is half humorous but half real points which okay. is if people want a virtue signal so bad and pretend that they'll do anything to make female esports succeed obvious way to combine the two similar make a pay-per-view option then you can all virtue signal Ooh. how you paid for the pass that's actually even a good idea dude people might do it right you may be able to do it, and then you would actually have a source of revenue to to, to play with as well. That's not because the joke is money side. instead of certain other psyop type things that they all love to do the picture of, they could even have a little sticker like, "I just bought the ESL Impact League." Ding, you know, <laughs> for your social media, it could go in a little Dude, square. Did you, see, did you see those those guys that dressed up as English knights that tried to get in to watch a British game and they got thrown? Oh, out right, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> dude that was so Cup. Good. Yeah. they weren't let in but it was so epic like the, for the british team <laughs> so good there have been some good memes i have not watched a single minute of this uh of this um uh, this world cup or whatever that's going on i could care less but the memes i do care about there, there's been some good memes coming out of it so that's been fun it's been entertaining on that front <laughs> Not only is there still loads of CS score to bet on, as well as all the other games in esports, you can still enter the free to enter World's Prediction Series 2 competition with a 10 million USDT prize pool. And you can get not just the usual free to enter 1000 DJT that they give you to start making predictions and try to win the 300,000 USDT first place, but you can get 50 times that. You can get 50,000 DJT as your start by going to the Discord, discord.gg slash esports bet and messaging the mod mail saying you want the 50,000 DJT. All right. Uh, let's see. So enough about the female scene. Let's see. Uh, actually, I really want to get your take on this one because, all right, so this is, this is, um, 
this is an interview that James did post major in which he mentions the main thing that stands out, the headline that really stands out. And I think the main takeaway from the whole interview is that uh, James, according to himself, would forbid using notes by players during the match, i.e. those 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 reefs of paper, those sheafs of paper that Navi have, for example, that are color coded, et cetera. Jame, in his ideal world, you wouldn't be able to do that as a, as a team anymore and that it would be all in the IGL's head and that, a fa- and that a factor of being a pro, if you're going to be a pro, is that you should be able to memorize strats. You should be able to memorize things and have all of that ready to go when you need it and be able to call it up on memory on command. And so he said he considers that actually a part of being a professional player that you should be able to commit things to memory and bring them up at will and that it should be the IGL who's the one calling the shots and the one getting it done. I can kind of see where James is coming from here. I think I think obviously the main one that the main culprit that always gets attention is Navi who always have these, you know, reams of paper going with like the color coded and the bold and the underlined and everything. So you got the players just looking at it between every round. Maui has talked about this in the past where it is a point where you can build out a T side half where each round is planned, where it turns into a bit of a, a flow chart from top to bottom. So say you win the pistol round, you're going to do this. You, you lose the pistol round, you're going to do this. And then you build it out from there. You can have a whole T side half that's just built out. If then sort of situations, right? Where you have a flow chart scenario uh, going and that kind of replaces. I think this is what James is really getting at is that, it kind of replaces if you build out everything that way, it replaces the role of an IGL and the coach standing behind the team can actually be the IGL because he can build out the whole T side for you. And then all you need to worry about is having some protocol set up on CT side and you play from there, which valve have shown in the past that they're not a big fan of. They do not want the coach to be the IGL. They want it to all be within the five man team. And also it seems like James is maybe having a little bit of an issue on this, that, uh, that perhaps the coach is having a bit too much say in matters. If, uh, if he can literally build out your entire T half for you. So I'm curious to hear what you think about this topic because we, we've, we've had a bit of a discussion in the past about coaches, the sixth man, IGL, should the IGL be in game, should he not be? So like, what, what do you think about Jamin uh, Jame and his thoughts here? The key thing for me is it's how you frame it. Like if, as you say, you frame it along the lines, which Jim actually is, as you, you're right. He's a, he's on a similar wavelength to Valve. Valve's logic, if you don't know, can be boiled down to this, Right. Basically, they think Counter-Strike is just five players playing mm-hmm. together. In fact, if you ever look at how they structure the major, at least to this point, and how they seed it, etc., they really do want it to be, as naive as this is, that in theory, if me and you made a team tomorrow and we played and we were good enough, we could qualify and win the major. That's like the world yes, wants to living. Dream. It's a totally implausible, naive one, and they give up a lot of other things to have it. But that's clearly their fundamental position, right? So their position, if you don't know, is the reason they think coaches shouldn't be allowed to talk all the time, and especially shouldn't be allowed to be the leader, is because they their implication is when me and you make our team or to make it less ridiculous instead of me and you just a tier three team if they don't have a true like coach maybe they don't even have the money or professional like org to have a coach if Mm -hmm. they don't have a coach obviously it's slightly unfair if they play Astralis and Astralis had Zonic right like that makes it seem like you're not just trying to beat Astralis you have to beat Zonic as well and you don't have a coach so they automatically win by having more money and a better org and all that jazz right I get the premise they're based on right the problem is I obviously fundamentally disagree with it I'm one of the few people who wants coaches to be able to talk all the time. I think it will just make okay. a better level of Counter-Strike. Like, by the way, I actually think Na'Vi is the best example on both ends. In my opinion, Na'Vi is proof of why you want coaches to be able to have massive impact because they literally did kick out their IGL and still won, like, what, like, the next tournament that they played or whatever the fuck, like, they won that blast earlier this year when they had some guy young coming as the stand-in and electronic takeovers. They immediately won another championship and stayed an elite team. Now, most people would say that's because of Blade and all those fuck in notes like yeah. Navi really is a team where the idea is I thought I that- would be one of them though what do you like, mean? I would be I would be one of those people who says that is because of Blade and all those notes. Oh, it is. Electronic I agree. Also happens to be his protege. Yeah, but this is the problem. That's why I like that because I think that that's good. Essentially, why I like Summer is that Blade has more impact than some Da Young does or whatever on the team. Like I think that's good. Okay. Because okay. I think Blade's a genius, and I want to see him have his impact on Counter Strike. The problem is if you do go from the GM slash Valve perspective, I think they're right. Like if it's supposed to be that like the coach only talks during timeouts, then why are we getting to like refresh our memory on what the coach Coach might say on a piece of paper between rounds like that mm. does seem off and quite frankly i agree with jim that is literally the job of a pro player is to remember the strats that you learned in practice it's not during the game for someone to go oh don't worry just just look on like page two that's where the strats are like yeah, exactly. no 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 actually that's like cheating in the exam mate like 
You're already supposed to learn it before. Yeah, you're already supposed to learn before you go to the exam, aren't you? So to me, I sort of agree with him. Like, I think Navi is the best example. If you took that aspect away of the notes, like, like Navi would still be a very good team, but I bet they would be worse. And I bet they, I bet a bunch of their players would. Because one thing I always thought about their team, by the way, is they seem to have cohesion in their squad that I don't think can come from the players. I think it comes from how like mm. the, the full spectrum way of coaching that player has, and they're just all on the same page, but it certainly helps to literally have a page that you all have in front of you with the same thing written on. Like they've taken it too far. So as, here's the thing. Fundamentally I'm against it. Cause I just want the best level counter strike played. But if, if we're going from this angle of a James slash valve, which is like, Counter Strike is supposed to be five players, and a coach can talk like two times a half of whatever. Then he's right. Like I think this is too much info to have. And quite frankly, by the way, I actually think some of the other teams out there have been really silly not to exploit this themselves. I'm amazed at the teams that haven't done this. Like logically, in this era, everyone should have had these notes and should have been able to refer back to stuff. You might. That's the other thing I always wondered about as well, Sam. But not everybody has a blade. They never bother bringing that up. What is the basis on how you're allowed to have notes? Like, for example, how far does this go? Like, can I also just have a whole binder of, like, anti-strats for the other team and just scroll through them, like, oh, oh, there's the trade ones. Like, can I do that as well? Like, how far do we go with this? I never thought of it myself, but that's almost like an ASIC type topic itself, really, isn't it? I think that is where it goes, though. I don't think that there is any limitation on what you can have. I mean, not even, dude, oh. their notes are pages. They have pages, and they're color-coded. They're built out. So, I mean, I don't think that there's any limitation right now on, on that front at all. Uh, and... The thing, okay, so that that's one point, right? I don't think there's any limitations on the note on the note giving. The other thing, though, and also technically, if you take a load of screenshots, Samler, then Blade could just flip through it like one of those flick books when you're a kid and show you the actual pistol. I'm like, look, look, it's it's kind of hot. (laughs) You know those old (laughs) ones where you draw like the guy moving along, and then you get on the edge of the page. You you know the era of the old school art that you flick through the book and he kicks the goal in the top corner. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> the old cartoon script. That's the level that you need to teach some of these. Exactly. I I, I, listen, if we can do a flip book, I think Smoothie can actually be a top pro, guys. <laughs> I was waiting for it, dude. I was waiting for it. There's the setup. Because <laughs> here's the problem. Even though this isn't the case, just because of all those stories, it just makes me think that when like Smoothie is at boot camp, he's in like a fucking high chair with a bib on, like. I'm hungry. <laughs> 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 makes it sound ridiculous. No, but dude. I had somebody, somebody confirmed it for me the other day. They literally ran into people, young people now, like 17, 18, who didn't know how to use a knife and fork. That's so it's not it. just smooth. Like apparently this is a thing now amongst young people who they don't know how to use utensils. Bah, what? That's mad, how? That's mad. Okay. Um, what do you think about being like, do you, okay. So this is the, when I was thinking about this with the James situation, I'm like, okay, fair enough. Notes. Uh, these are probably anti stress These are probably details. But One do, thing I do have to ask is this, though. So now because James won the major, we're all consulting him like he's like the fucking Dalai Lama or something. Like, Jim, what should we do about notes? And I'm like, as a enlightened being, I believe notes should not be required by the human race. Like, oh, who the fuck are you? About a week ago, you were just some guy who saved the op too much. Like, that's the only <laughs> thing I don't get. Why is he just making, like, decrees now? Like, t- change it, change it all. Now people want to listen. What the fuck? Now people want to listen. <laughs> like, okay. how do you... Okay, I, but this is like... I'm 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 actually kind of curious about this because this is something that's been talked about in the past where it's like you could do a few rounds at a time. But what do you think? Is it possible? Do you think theoretically it's possible to build out an entire half on T side of if then? So you could just have a flow sheet of like if we if we're doing this, we're doing this strat in the pistol round. If we lose it, we're doing this strat. If we win it, we're doing this strat, and then just build out from there. Literally just win loss and you go all the way down throughout the entire rounds. Could you actually try to build out a half that way? Do you think that's realistic? Even possible? I think it's possible. Or do you think, uh, you have to remember, what, probably one of the mis- most misunderstood things about tactics in Counter-Strike. It's why I think, by the way, it's a massive counter signal if all you ever talk about on Reddit is like the tactical understanding, though, because like they do, it's not, it doesn't have as yeah. big an impact as people think. It's why if you are, by the way, a really tactical IGL, we tend to praise you to the heavens because most teams actually are running a quite simplified playbook. It's more like on a T side of a map, pick a map that they play quite often. Most of the time, they're just running like three or four strats, guys. The point is just when do they run it? And they're trying to guess based on how the defense is playing is this the right timing to run this on they're not going through like fans really believe that every IGL has like 50 T strats for every fucking map no but the problem I have Sam Lewis, is why I'm bringing this up is I do think having these notes gets you closer to that latter scenario because now you mm-hmm. can have the two or three strats they really remember from the scrims but you can have all these weird trick players so look if you talk about the idea of planning the whole game out 
Like, I think you could roughly do it because essentially all you'd be looking for in the early part of the floor chart is something like, are they playing conservatively? Are they like taking angles against someone? And then from that, you'd branch it out, wouldn't you? Like, right, they're playing quite into us. So, you know, we'll play a bit more passive. And here's our two or three base setups. If they're playing aggressively, then we go the other mode and maybe we do a bunch of dry hits or something. You know, we don't have to use utility to get them out of position because they're playing passive. Or yeah, you could, you could build up the basics. And then crucially, remember, because you do have the timeouts, you can always just update it, can't you? So if you start, out yeah. trying a certain style and it's going badly after three rounds blade just calls his time out exactly. right guys flip to the other one going the, we're exactly. doing a different tree or whatever i think that's plausible i think that's i mean i you know it's like this i is don't think anyone except exercise, blade probably tried that it that is what navi are doing sounds plausible doesn't it like i think that that's what navi are doing i don't think that navi have got that in depth uh you know for electronic to be fragging as hard as he can i think that you have to have a system or as hard as he is, you have to have a system that permits him to free up some of that, uh, some of that, uh, some of that Ram, right? Like it's just, if you have, if you, if you've already got preset strategies that are already written down for you, where it's just like, if then go this here, do that. And then blade, like you say, can chime in if things get hairy to help you out at that point. Yeah. You can focus on your crosshair a whole lot more. You're just like, okay, hold on. We just won that round. Good. We're running this round now. Dude, done. No, don't need to think about it. Hmm, hold on the field. Let me see the penumbras. Let me figure out what's going on here. No, none of that. You just, you, if you could just follow a flow chart and a guy can like, and the, I guess, you know what, the guy who's watching over your shoulder can just jump in at any point in time to set you back on the correct course of the flow chart. Uh, the, this system could really work. And then at that point, you really don't need that much of an IGL. This is why Navi are as dangerous as they are, because if, if that's the case, electronic is only maybe what half an IGL. If that, I don't know if you remember this because this is a topic we talked on the old by the numbers. So like, obviously you weren't there at the time. Do you know this story? It's a real story from back during the Astralis era when they had Zonic and Glaive and all those guys. Do you ever hear the story that supposedly back in, I forget if it was 2018 or 2019, but one of these years I found out from behind the scenes that supposedly Astralis at one point actually did used to practice by having Zonic in the scrim yes. call and and then Grave just got to tell, like go to the same angles and sort of work on his fragging. And the reason I bring this up is because people might know one of the most interesting pieces of trivia about Astralis is not only did Glaive usually frag way better than an IGL should be possible to do, but he even once won an MVP. I think it was like IM Beijing or something where he like fragged out. Right, guys, if you're on like one of the greatest tactical teams of all time and you're calling the strats and you frag out, like the point is that should be impossible. But when you hear that story, like someone in practice is sort of letting him like you say, free up a bit of the bandwidth and practice something else. It starts to make sense, doesn't it? It's quite logical that that would be the one guy ever who did it. So no, I sort of agree with you, mate. I even think that's part of why they were willing to try electronic as the IGL. Because on paper, yeah. you wouldn't want to take a piece like that off the table. That's like taking one of your best pieces in the whole game and being like, right, we're going to limit some of what you could do fragging-wise. You'd normally never do that. But in this case, it almost makes sense, right? If he really just has to like half run the system. And in this case, by the way, if they've got all the notes similar and in scrims played maybe even calls then at that point in time all you're doing is calling numbers out like you're just like his field marshal you're not even a real IG at that point so it, it, I, I think it could even make sense if you're someone like player who wants to have that impact to do this style of team hmm. interestingly enough i'm just checking the stats here now that you're mentioning it i mean to, to try and check this out real quick but electronic is actually the the bottom rated. He hasn't had a very good last few tournaments. But here's the thing: when he first began as IGL, which was the last spring fight, he was fighting out of control. First, yeah, first few tournaments he was doing great, mate. So I don't yeah. blame it. He also might just individually be on a slot. Let's be real: a bunch of Navi's not as good as they were. Yeah, no, right. But the, the the point still stands. Like he, um, when you see when he's one of your top three rated players on a team full of fraggers like Bit and Electronic. I mean, Bit and Simple. Like you're you're competing with those guys, Perfecto. Like you're you're competing with those guys for uh, for kills, and you're still up there as the IGL. It just makes me think that, yeah, Blade has really figured it out. He's got the game figured out. He's got, he's clearly got a system. And this is the thing you have to, you have to buy into his system. And so he's had years to work with these players now. That, what, to answer your question about why other teams don't have it, I think it's because they don't have a Blade. They don't have somebody who has been through as much of an experience as Blade has. Keep in mind, Blade has been around since what? Like the beginning of 1.6 oh, almost? Just, like the guy yeah. has just lived and breathed Counter Strike for 15 plus years. So he's seen it all. He's played all the roles. He's, he's done it all. So, like who actually I'm putting you on the spot here actually <laughs> go on a little bit but you know if you were to if you were to try and go for a western player like a western equivalent is zonic that kind of equivalent or do you think about somebody else who could potentially no because here's the problem zonic himself wasn't an igl he was sort of like the secondary caller or whatever so the real problem is there isn't anyone in the west actually like if people don't know carrigan himself wasn't even like a proper igl basically in 1.6 the closest mm -hmm. if he was still around would be someone like a god b i guess but even god b didn't right. play as long into 1.6 so like that you have to go for someone like that that's 
the sort of like equivalent you could maybe pick out. Because there's another person who always had like massive impact on his teams, great mind for the game, figured out all the different matches. There's not many though. Blade, people don't know. Blade really is some like fucking Gandalf type character. <laughs> he really he is. Through all eras of Counter Strike, he just never disappears. Ever. It's amazing to me. Dude, I'm loving it too because his English is getting better and better. So I'm looking forward to a new interview. Like you got to get him in there, man. Because the last interview you did with him was terrific. It was right when Simple was was yeah, yeah. What, when they were trying to start getting Simple under his wing. Yep. But you, it was clear it was just before they got really good. Talk honestly about yes. Simple. You know, there was clearly some difficulties there still with Simple getting him into to grade in. And so that was a fascinating interview to to listen to. I loved it. So I hope that you're going to be able to get him on again soon because now his English is even better. And he's got even more experience. Yeah, I can tell people. I've talked to Blade privately like a bunch of times. And he is someone where, like, the better his English gets, they're going to be amazing interviews, guys. Like, it reminds me in League of Legends, there used to be a guy like this. There was a jungler called Diamond Prox who played for Gambit for late enough in Moscow 5, if people remember. And this guy was, you could tell from the way he played, like some genius level player. And all I'll tell you is, over the years, I did like maybe three interviews with him, right? And because each interview was like three or four years apart, the last one I'm going to say was like, I don't know, five, six years ago now. Now. by the end dude when he was like six seven years in dude his english got really good and you realize like holy shit i was right like once you can actually like express yourself you can unlock all that genius so i know from some private conversations blade can go way deeper than he does in those like on camera interviews with like heku or fucking Freya or whatever he gives very simple answers there and also by the way because he's old school and he's like a chess player he's not going to give you real info that's why when he tells you shit in interviews like we're practicing vertigo that's part of his fucking chess game mate like yeah he's not exactly. really giving away what they're doing like so the other thing is you're gonna need to do it like that as well where it's like an interview where you can reflect back on stuff he's not gonna tell you right now how they run the team but the key thing for me Sam is maybe in two years i could find out how this team ran and how we swapped it from boomage to electronics that'll be when it's interesting i agree yeah, i bet yeah. there's a fascinating story oh there must be but i mean i like it's 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 why i never really People were like, oh, no, what are they going to do without Boomich on the team? I was just like, dude, they're, they're going to be perfectly fine. They oh, it seemed like the most still. slammed up team of all time to good. survive. Exactly. And uh, and I, I still think it's possible to turn it around here, even though they're in a little bit of a dip right now. It's I, it's going to be really interesting to see how they finish out this year. And, uh, you know, starting into next one when they actually settle on a roster. Uh, I mean, now we're just going into a Navi tangent. And we might as well go into a bit of a Navi tangent because they are competing in Blast right now. And they did have, uh, they did have a, a strong start sure. over Fluxo, but I mean, that was a given that they were going to have a strong start over Fluxo. There wasn't really any you know big shock there. Uh, Fluxo got annihilated by G2 as well today. So Fluxo are out, predictably so. I don't think that shocks anybody. But uh, it's nice that Navi had, a, had, a, had an easy game to get started with, you know? And, uh, and now they're, uh, they're, as we're recording this, they're tied 1-1 with Liquid. So Liquid had to had to really go hard on the first map of this series, Inferno, win at 16-14. And, but now Dust2 went the way of Na'Vi. So uh, it's interesting to see that Na'Vi are still hanging in here because Liquid are going to be prepared for this Na'Vi team. They're going to be really dialed in and they're going to be hungry. So uh, it's not going to be an easy winner's match by any stretch for Na'Vi, but it looks like Na'Vi at least is fighting back here. That's impressive because I heard that actually most of the morning, Yakinda had the guys on a really strict <laughs> schedule where he was showing them how to put their trousers on, breathe air, and then fucking like take in like fucking like nutrients out of food and stuff. So he he didn't even, you have to understand, they're so limited at team. Look, he hadn't even got a chance to get to the, the blackboard and start making his notes, you know, like... In fact, the joke is, Yakindar's knowledge about the game is so deep and powerful. He's like the old school Catholic church. He doesn't even allow Team Liquid players to read. Then that that's too holy for them. His information, he, like his thing of not equivalent of like Blade shit is like his like diary. And he doesn't allow anyone access to that. But he just gives you a gem every now and then, like in Latin, of course, like, rah, 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 rah. and you have to, oh, what's yeah, that you mean? Oh, you just have to intuit what <laughs> Yakindar meant by it because Yakindar is just some like fucking saintly figure, obviously. He said in his words he says it himself he has to do it because he wants to win you know otherwise <laughs> i saw you like that tweet i did where it was like it leaves takes a breath you can do i was like i told him i do that like yeah that, that's like how far these interviews feel like they've got now did it like because the thing i don't get is this do that no storyline shouldn't even be alive anymore guys because the team he left just won the fucking major they won it without him. Like, what does he... I'm, I'm being serious, guys. What does this guy know about Counter-Strike that I'm missing? Because as far as I can tell, he's just a really skilled young player that has an interest in mind for entry. But that's about it. I don't know where this... I, I really don't get it somewhere as to why people treat him like he's like prime Zipnix who knows like every angle and calculate. Like, what are they talking about? Like, he's just a really good player. That's it. Like, I think he's, that angle's gone too far opener. now. He's oh, listen. Four maps. He's uh, got his a 1.7 rating. 
Kane like I is it. the runner-up with a one. Uh, his role, he is mega, but I actually find it insulting. The idea he's implying that he's teaching like Nitro and Elise how Counter Strike works. Like, homie, they could stop tomorrow and they will play more finals and win more trophies than you ever will in your whole life. Like, they don't have to do anything more in their career to prove themselves. Like, it's just like that's just that, that just shows. By the way, I'm not. I'm going to call out so that I normally never call out. That's actually like bias against NA, dude. Because what people are trying to imply is because NA hasn't been on top for a while that people like Elise, super legendary players, are like morons who don't know how Counter Strike works or something like. That's not why they're not winning for fuck's sake. Like spoiler, you know their team has like Nitro, who's got terrible stats, or seems average as fuck. Mm. That, like that, that's two of their members of their team. Now then go look at like FaZe Clan. Now, like these teams are full of bangers, mate. Like, I don't think it's anything to do with not knowing Counter Strike that's caused them to lose. Like, they're just not as good a team. And even then, as you say, they're not a bad team. Team because a pretty solid squad. They're what, like the sixth best team or something? They're pretty sick. They're pretty legit. Yeah, no, they can hit they can hit hard. I mean, you kinder creates enormous opportunities for them with this entry, and they know how to play off of it now as well. So maybe that's another reason why he's maybe taking credit because it's like because he is there to give those opportunities. The, the team benefits and so he feels like this is this is what he's bringing to the table and so he is making that difference in their game plan well good on him fine i mean if you have a one seven rating on four maps uh, for opening kills holy shit you know no, that's that's, like, those, yeah, of course that's crazy numbers those are crazy numbers Absolutely. That's, that's insanely high so if you're opening the round up and getting the man advantage for your team that often it's like okay fine fair enough you deserve a pat on the head for that for sure uh, big reason why Liquid may be competitive right now because Elise is still finding his footing. Him and Naf are kind of hanging around, um, doing their thing as well. Not dropping off the way we saw in the major, thankfully. They're definitely hitting a bit harder here in this tournament. Uh, but um, you know, as far as uh, as far as Liquid are concerned, it's it still feels like a stretch for them to beat a team like Navi, where SDY has got something to prove. I mean, they're talking about bringing in a player. I mean, already this tournament, as I understand it, Nipple is at the tournament now, and if they play. Shoot, what was the map off the top of my head? I think it was Vertigo or Ancient. I mean, that's what Vertigo is the one that's a permaban. You mean they're going to test him out on the permaban? I think they were going to test him out on the permaban. Right. There, there, there was some, there was some scenario where makes sense. he would be, he would step in for a map if it gets played. If Navi end up playing that map, he's ready to play it, and otherwise he's going to be stepping in and in, uh, in the um, World Finals coming up in a couple of weeks for Navi. So Navi are taking the time to actually play around a little bit with the roster, but this tournament at least, I mean, SDY is going to be hungry. He has to make a, he has to make an impact. He has to show that he deserves a spot on the team because they've already got the replacement waiting in the wings. So this is I think this is a Navi that should be overperforming, if anything, and just smash and face. What do you think? The thing is, I actually think like as a team, it's basically like I'm pretty sure. Wasn't it? I don't know where this was, some, but I'm almost certain somewhere online in the last week or so, it was even implied that like some Dai Young's already looking for another team or like mm -hmm. he's going to be leaving the team. It was basically implied, guys. Like, it, I, I almost got the implication, even if they win, they're going to replace him. Like, they just I put it in the show notes last week. I thought, yeah. that, I thought that that was a thing, and then it turns out it wasn't. Oh, was it? Well, there's the problem. I suspect personally, unless they just stomp the whole event, he will be replaced. Like, it just seems like the writing's on the wall. And also, like I said before, no one really was arguing that he was a really good player when he was kept to the team. Our argument before was because they won the blast turn right out of the gate. It was sort of like, well, look, if he can just do that and then not fuck everything else up. Like I say, it was a not, it's a don't rock the boat move. If you can just sort of keep doing whatever the fuck you're doing, good or bad, and just let simple and electronic a bit carry, then don't worry about it, we'll keep you. But actually, sure. that isn't really grounds to have someone on a team you have to like fulfill a certain role and fit the style of the team and all the so i have to say i do think it's time to replace him i agree with you though i actually think because in theory if you're someday you know, you know it's over anyway this is the last tournament and they're going to change players i actually think this is probably the perfect time for navi to just sort of like have no pressure on them at all and just blow through the tournament like i could see them win this tournament mate i think they're certainly going to be strong at a minimum it's, it's absolutely possible absolutely possible that they can pull this off uh, it's it's exciting, man. It's exciting because FaZe, I mean, we might as well just talk about the tournament. Uh, FaZe have hit the ground running. FaZe are looking really good. They got, what is it, out of the top three players. Dude, they have the top three performing players in the tournament so far across four maps. Brokey, Twists, and Rain. All of them. All of them have clutch moments. All of them have sick plays. All of them have opening kills. Twist in particular was a savage on a couple of these maps. Here's how it's you like, know, Semler, the biases people have in the scene. Because I figured this out years ago. Here's how you know who people are biased in favor of. They just don't mention them when they do badly. So you know what the major, everyone said, you you saw it like, Fears failed. Like, wow, Carrigan failed. No, no, what happened, Semler, was this. You know, Brokey, the MVP of IM Katowice, the first tournament they won this year, dude, he was under like a 1.0 rating or something for the major. Like, he had like a really bad major. He just had a bad 
bad tournament. He had missed loads of shots, lost loads of clutches. Like he just, it just wasn't a good tournament. Now, I don't have a problem with that, by the way. In fact, the good thing about FaZe is usually they can survive one player having an off tournament. But so many people are fans of Brokey, and among analysts especially, he almost has like a universally good sort of perception. No one really hates on him. Like, I think people were just a bit biased and just didn't bother mentioning he just had a really bad tournament. Like, if so, like one of the things that's cool about FaZe, like we've talked about in the past, is everyone except Carrigan basically can be an MVP because even bloody Reigns being an MVP in the major. Like, the cool thing about their teams, they can do it by committee. So, in my opinion, that's why I thought it was wild, dude, that people were just out on FaZe. Like, because people were saying, like, they should change players. Like, you know, they've only lost about, like, three lands all year or something. Like, and you yeah. know, it's win everything. Like, I would never cut a play. Here's the thing. FaZe is that team, like, my old motto. You don't ever change a winning lineup until you know what you can't win anymore. Like, there's another team. It's, like, who would be surprised if FaZe just won this tournament, man? Of course they could. I would. Of course. Dude, actually, I'm looking just a little bit further down now, and it's like, yeah, no, actually, I wouldn't be surprised at all, because, all right, so you got Brokey at 139, Twist at 138, Rain at 129, but then you just go down. Kerrigan, 1.2 rating. That's impossible obviously already. I know and Rops is at 1.17. So you don't you have nobody who's even close to 1.0. Like, holy they've just had terrific a terrific like you could not have this a better start back. to the tournament. Yeah. You could not have a better start to the tournament. So good on them on that front. I mean, they two owed heroic. They blasted him out of the server on Inferno, second map of that series, 16-5, just a nylon. I caught a good bit of that one. It was just like, okay, this is heroic or checked out mentally now. This is this is painful to watch. Sure is convenient, isn't it, Semla? Because like a week or so ago, Heroic were gonna win the major. They were in the final. Guys, there's you know, the major doesn't actually is the thing as a tournament, it's the most important, but people keep doing the similar. They take most important and act like that means the only important thing. Like the rest of the year was real. We all watched all the rest of the year. Like we all know phase is way better than heroic. Like, why are we pretending like oh, I've been through the looking glass now? I thought heroic was the best. Ah, yeah. No, of course not. Come on, man. They still have all the same problems they always did. But this is one of those critical factors, right? Where now they have that they have that champion experience and they have that champion uh, that champion know how. And Twist actually said that one line in the, in a post match interview where you know everything's going right, and he's just like, yeah, we just had to remember who we are, right? And it's go. like that's that's what the champions yes. can always fall back on. It's like, no, we win the tournaments. We are the team in the in the server that needs to be beaten, not the ones that are trying to beat somebody else. It's, and so once you have that that you flip that switch and you just know that you're superior. That that's what you're dealing with when you're dealing with phase and oh, I'll give you a great one, Sam. Out again here along those lines. Look, obviously, like as usual with my messages to players. Sadly, I have a really bad track record where when I send players like nice compliments, if it's before the tournament's over, some of they always bomb and don't make it as far as they should and like losing the semi. Sorry. So unfortunately, I have a bad track record. But basically, <laughs> after that series, if people remember where. I think it was it was before the series that eliminated them at the major and after they'd lost. Uh, I think what happened was, off the top of my head, I know eventually Liquid lost to, like, Spirit. And I think before that, they lost to, like, Mouse or something, shit like that. In the major. They lost, like, two bad, series yeah. that were dodgy, right? Or maybe it was a rogue even. And basically, yeah. when they've lost the first one, Elijah had, like, a map where he got, like, I think he had, like, four kills or something, if you remember, like, two kills or something outrageous. So yeah, I actually, because I mean, Elijah's one of those players, like Device, like, simple over the years, who I've sent messages to and sort of befriended a little bit. I sent him a message. It was exactly what you're talking about, Samler. This is the way I phrased it. I just said something along the lines of, like, like in like you look lost out there, mate. Just get out of your own way and let a leash play. That was my point. It's like, mate, like so that would be for real my speech if I was a coach, by the way. If you have a player on the level of like an Elise, it's like, bro, you're not some like young player I'm trying to figure out. You could make it. One you're a leash. Like, the fuck? Like, you know, that's team spirit out there, a bunch of nobodies. Like, all you have to do, mate, literally, is just like look in the mirror and go, oh, yeah, wait a minute. I'm one of the best players of all time. What am I doing wrong? Get my game together and fucking go out. Like, you're, you're right. Like, if you're someone like FaZe, there's no amazing like fucking equation has to be cracked the real question is just why aren't we at the top level that we can be at and so yeah if you just actually everyone goes back to what they're good at a team like phase is always going to be elite mate oh yeah no you don't really see the the friday night light speech before matches there you know no, no. Like, Kadeen is still giving that and he is going to have to keep giving that because you know they're still looking for that trophy but uh phase they don't need to give that they don't need to give that speech they they know they know they there's so much experience on that roster and now like i wonder if we're if this is a return because the Rio Major in and of itself was such a unique experience, I think, with the venue, the crowd, how it all played out. I mean, everything about that Major is weird, right? It's, it's an outlier. 
And so here we're back into familiar territory. Everybody knows the Blast Stadium. These guys have been there multiple times over throughout the years. Everybody knows how to play at the. They know how to play in the Blast Studios where they're playing right now, and they know how to play in Copenhagen. They know how to play in the Royal Arena as well. So it makes sense that Phase would just come right back into their own here because this is familiar territory for them. They, they this is their stomping ground. They know what to do here. So it's a, and Kerrigan gets to play in front of a home audience, which is going to be interesting as well to see because they clearly cheer for him now. So no Astralis to get in the way here either. It's, it's shaping up to be a oh, by the way, event for them to end strong. As an aside, because you brought up that uh, Jame interview, which was, uh, I don't know if it was actually done by, but it was translated by eScore News, which is a lot of the yeah. Russian language stuff that people don't know. There was a line in there I thought I'd bring up where Jame says, Brazilians are extraordinary, open, positive, and emotional people. My only thought was, I wonder who's committing all the murders. <laughs> <laughs> who's spitting on the players it's mental in it at all oh yeah <laughs> that part oh yeah no and oh, man that is the only thing i do have a problem with is this there was one other point and i'll bring it up just to be petty because it's my style which is because people have famously obviously told jim he's boring he tried a, a fucking reference which is such a reach i refuse to acknowledge it which is even though jim acknowledges he himself doesn't know much about mma because he's heard that people think that like khabib is boring khabib nagomagedov he's acted like because people said he was bought by the way first of all i don't know where you've gotten that from who said he's boring like he has a wrestling style but that's not even the wrestler that people say is boring he's saying it dude like if we're talking about like fucking John Fitch or fucking GSP or something where or mm -hmm. Chael Sonnen where all they do is just wrestle fucking and hold you down like and even then by the way <laughs> that's that's slightly exaggerated but yeah true that is a style of fight the reason that doesn't work at all for you Jim is this because you're one of the biggest baiters and savers of all time the style that Habib has is constant pressure that's the opposite of your style of counter strike yeah, that's, that's like the Yakinda style of fighting mate like 24 7 trying to permit entry like so uh, fuck that noise you are not you are not Khabib just because you won the fucking major so and also, Habib's like one of the all-time great fights. You won one big tournament, you twat. Calm down, calm. <laughs> Damn, just calm it right down. Come on, just calm. That, that's a fair point. It's a fair point. I like the. I like your your. Uh, I like the analysis. So. Uh... Because the problem is, like, the opponent has the opposite feeling against Jim and against fucking Khabib. The whole thing is, do you ever watch the fight where it was Dustin Poirier against Khabib? Right, dude, that that's where that the moral line comes from, where he's like, I'm, I would never tap in front of the father, you know, because, like, he, like, oh, was yes. It? Was that it? No, no. No, no, that was the a... Justin Gaethje one. No, no, because no, 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 his dad was dead for the Justin Gaethje. No, yeah, no, no, that was it, where he, yes. had him, he had him in a guillotine. He had him in a guillotine, but he just had him in a guillotine. And, basically. like, Khabib was like, I would never tap in front of father. And he gets out of the guillotine and eventually, you know, gets the... No, here's right, what so. I was going to bring up, though. That fight contains the line that actually epitomizes what Habib's style like and why it's terrifying similar. Because there's a line where Dustin Poirier, who himself, by the way, has like a wrestling background, just says to his coach, I think it's after like the second round or something in the corner, he just goes like, dude, I just can't get him off me. Because that's the style of Habib. It's like permanent pressure, constantly on you, constantly using the body weight. Jim, you're the opposite, bro. The whole mm. point of that is like, it's like, where the fuck is this guy? Like, So I know that he just doesn't know MMA, so that's all cool. But whoever told you Habib's boring, I don't know the fuck that was a bit like they're boring how about that well that, that's a, that that would be somebody who doesn't have the appreciation for what habib is doing right but maybe uh maybe uh i guess this is one of those things where it's just like you don't really appreciate grappling until you actually maybe do it you know because then you understand oh it's almost really impossible to yeah and you feel you kind of have a sense of what it feels like to be in those positions yeah. as well so you have you give even more respect to the fighters because you're just like holy shit that sucks and you still pulled through what the fuck? oh dude i know you must love this as someone who does lots of sparring in jujitsu but i've actually had those morons in bars and when i was in america like watch parties for ufc say those immortal lines that you just look at them like you don't know what you're fucking talking about I've heard people say for real, Sam, like, bro, just get up already. It's four <laughs> rounds in. And you're like, you mean he's 20 minutes into a fight against the best fighter in the world and you're wondering why he can't physically get up while that guy's on top of his body? Like, what, what are you doing? This isn't a movie, you know? Like, he's, he's been fighting exactly. for 20 minutes. He's exhausted. Like, he's completely gassed. Like, That's it's the so thing. bad some of the thoughts they have in it at all. No, but it's so fun because now you can really see it as well. And not, but you also experience it because obviously you, the nice thing about like a well-structured uh, class is that you build up to it over time. So you start the class and maybe the warm up tires you out a little bit. You're like, oh man, okay, this is rough doing sit ups and stuff. Like, okay, you know, but then, you know, that gets easier over time. And then sure. you're going through the drills. Maybe those tire you out a little bit, you know, but like, okay, you know, a little bit more time. Those, those are all right. But then you're doing like the specifics at the end of class where you're really trying to drill a little bit more intensely and those wipe you out. And so by that, you know, but again, a little bit of time, you start building up that gas tank and then you start thinking, oh man, I'm pretty hot shit. And then you start rolling and a five minute round, your oh, first five minute you. round, you're wrecked, you yeah. want to puke.
Yep. You, it's just utter brutality. Like you, you are just completely gassed. I can't even imagine going like if you're grappling for like 20 minutes or something, yep. forget it. Those guys are freaks. They're absolute machines. But every time you try and get up, the guy's on your back yeah, using his whole it. body weight on you. You're just lifting two people. Up. Oh. And then this guy in a bar, it. like, just get up. Freakish just bloody stand up already, you coward. Like, <laughs> it's so mad in it. I don't know. It's such a funny thing. <laughs> that was actually the worst thing about UFC getting huge, by the way, was the amount of people. Like, I thought they were just memes, but they're real. I've heard people say those lines similar. Like, thing about me is I just wouldn't go out. I just fucking, I wouldn't, I'd just let him break my arm. Like, oh, shut up, you idiot. <laughs> you know I mean? Like, the joke is if I just did a fucking Chinese bird on this guy, he'd be like, oh, bloody hell. Like, he's talking like, just snap it. Snap my whole fucking arm. Snap my shit off like give me a break those are the kinds of guys you just want to catch in a wrist lock real quick just to see what i know do. although like, all i'd like all i would like to do for real summer is this if they could if they would let me do this i could shut all of them up instantly all i'm going to say is this is we i'm going to show you guys a move from ufc so you can see how it works right watch you lie on the ground like this i'll lie the other way i'm going to do what's called a, a leg lock on you right i'm going to go really slowly okay so look i've got it on now all i'm going to do is cinch it up and if you don't know by the way guys when you even just get it in the right it already starts to her. Before the person hurts, puts, yeah. before the person puts any pressure on, you can already feel like, whoa, what's going on with my muscle on my leg right there? That's why if you don't know, like <laughs> people like the really bad ones who were like quite malicious doing that, you could just rip the guy's whole muscle off his fucking board, mate. That's it. Those <laughs> those moves are outrageous. The leverage you can put, like you can't. The problem is, is that you're saying those similar. You actually can't as an outsider know what's going on. Like you, it doesn't look like that. It looks like nothing. It looks like you should yeah, do that. Top thing. of it's your so leg or something silly, doesn't it? Yeah. There's the way, really popular yeah, go clip on. going around for a second there, like a few weeks back, where it was a guy who was doing an ankle lock, a straight ankle lock. So it's like you catch the guy's ankle between in the crook of your arm, and then you're using your forearm to leverage against it, right? To lever against the guy's uh to, against the guy's leg, and you know it's his shin, and it's really does he break painful, his like shin? Like describing, it can be really painful really quickly if you catch the muscle, the Achilles, all that. But this guy, he put three baseball bat handles between. Oh, like, I saw in this. That he snaps you saw this? It. Yes. He fucking snaps him. And you're like. Holy shit. Oh, that guy no, must like, have a god tier fucking squeeze, mate. It's mental. There's no way. Can you about that, that, that you try to picture yeah. it right. So put my leg in That'll there. That'll be your now. leg in there. And he's nah. Nah, 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 Dude, nah. He, he cracks it like it's like a fucking lobster. you like one of those American that restaurants. so crazy. Mm, delicious. Yeah, it's so <laughs> crazy, dude. It's terrifying. Uh, it is. It's terrifying. It's like you it? could run into that guy at a tournament someday and just get your leg ripped off. Exactly. Like, oh, no, forget it. Not happening. Exactly. So funny. Perhaps... You're unfamiliar with esports bets, first time deposit bonus of up to 100 USDT bet forgiveness. So what you do is you make your first ever crypto bet on the site up to 100 USDT. If you lose it, message the mod mail discord.gg slash esports bet. Tell them last three nations sent you off or in and they'll give you up to the 100 USDT, your initial stake back for that bet. Pro tip, I would bet on an underdog, someone with like two, 2.5, three odds. So if you win the bet outright, you just get a multiplier. If you lose, you get your original stake back. All right, well, now, so, uh, James Tangent. Oh, dude, actually, shit, there was another piece of news, actually, and I was curious if you managed to catch that Oscar interview at all. Oh, I saw a little bit, of it, yeah. Titans. Yeah. Like, that is, uh, it kind of explains what, I, it gives us a bit of insight into what was actually going on behind the scenes there, because there was a lot of attention on Titans, obviously, not the best uh, attention at first, because the name, the logo, uh, there was a lot of things that you were kind of questioning what the direction and what was going on over there. But they had the roster, they had MSL, they had Oscar, they had Sonny. It's like, okay, they got, they're cooking. And they supposedly games. had money was the premise, right? Remember, we all, there was supposed to, like a bunch of them had been paid for years. Based in Switzerland or something. Like they were supposed to actually have some, right? Based in Switzerland, I, I'm pretty sure. But like they were supposed to have some cash. They were supposed to be in a place like that. But now it's coming out that Oscar is saying that Sonny is owed like 100K in back pay that he just wasn't getting paid. And Oscar himself only got like a salary and a half over the nine month period he was on the team. And, the, and that he even implies that he kind of got suckered into it, that uh, Sonny and L LMBT were messaging him, trying to get him to join the team. And uh, and throughout that period of time where they would have been messaging him, they would have also they would have been experiencing the money problem. So they will they kept it from him, basically them in. Yes. Coming onto this team, despite the fact that they were experiencing these problems with the organization. So Oscar, long story short, is back on sinners now. And he says that it's a it's a mistake that he ever left, because had he known. Uh, friends or not, he wouldn't have joined this uh, this Titans project. But it's a shame. There was this one tidbit in it as well where he describes his interaction with MSL. And I want to get your take on that one because it's, it seems like the way he's describing it is that MSL had an outdated way of looking at the game and that MSL would not be open for discussion either 
if somebody had something to say about a strat or something like that, that MSL would shut up, would clam up and that it would become a trigger situation. And so the one, one comment that I read was actually pretty interesting in that uh, somebody brought up, you know, well, like Kerrigan says, you know, if you call, if you call around, there's no discussion, you shut up about it. Uh, we don't know the exact context, unfortunately, in Oscar's interview about like when somebody would have been discussing something with him, if it was in a round or not. You know, it could be that you're being uncharitable in that situation and you're trying to have a discussion during a round, which is not what you're supposed to do. But I don't know. What, what, do, you, what do you think? Was there any takeaways for you from this article uh, with Oscar? Sure. I mean, first of all, on the Titans angle, it actually now, believe it or not, this makes way more sense than the premise before when they were just closing down. Because as I said at the time, Sam, the part that never made any sense to me about this project, Titans, which formerly was the Gorillas people, if you remember, was that that was announced as a project a long time ago. It was when Flusher right. left like Fanatic or whatever. And basically, if you remember, when they made that squad, like I said, they, like three of them were getting paid, we thought, for like a year or something before the team even came along. And it just had some weird, it wasn't called Titans at the time, remember? It wasn't like an org name. It was just some weird mix project that they kept replacing the fourth and fifth players in, right? That makes no sense, Sam, as to why you'd pay some players for years and years with no, no, you're not getting anything back for it. You're just throwing money into a pit. And at the end, you launch the team, it does badly for a month or two and you just shut the whole thing down. That makes no sense. It makes way more sense if what actually happened was you were, it was maybe like, look, not a full-on Ponzi scheme, but that sort of vibe of like, look, guys, I can pay the first salaries, then you got to like mm. stay in and look, don't worry if we get like the first couple of months under our belt, we get the sponsor. That's like the old esports trick back in the day, isn't it? That's how you always get tricked by some manager type guy who maybe seems legit enough that he knows this sponsor and he might be able to get you more. Like that's just how esports always used to run. So on that one, that at least makes sense. Now I get like maybe they never had the money, maybe the team was never that legit, maybe it was just something that they all convinced themselves because a couple of them got paid a little bit. It's going to be legit. And also, let's be real, a lot of them didn't have many good options. They're all they're all in scenarios. It was online era where. A lot of them would have had a bad career for them and looked terrible. Then on the side about MSL, I actually don't think there's any confusion at all on this one for me. The reason why Oscar thinks this about MSL is because Oscar is probably the worst player MSL could coach. Uh, uh, IGL. Here's why. Because okay. MSL originally was the most extreme version of like a playbook from spawn, here's the strap we're doing. You just go to your spot and I'll tell you the timing, right? He was the stereotype of that. Now, he's not as bad now. I've heard from a bunch of his teammates. He does like way more mid-rounding and he opens up the game a little bit more. Because that was his original style, even though he's come like more to the middle, we are, you have to know about Oscar, a lot of people won't know this, is if you look at the teams he's played in, he's not playing with any of the all-time great IGLs. Remember, his IGL was Chris J. Mm. People forget that. Before that, he briefly had, what, Nico was his IGL or something? Like, briefly in mouse, I guess. Like, he hasn't had, basically, like, great IGLs. So I've heard about Oscar. This is one of the downsides of his play, unfortunately, is because he is, like, a simple type character. Like, his raw talent is incredible. He is a guy you have to give, like, total freedom. Like, I've heard not only is he a guy where, like, he himself fucks his own game up. Like, supposedly, his teammates told me, Oscar's the guy where when he's rolling in the game, he is unbeatable. Like, he will hit every shot. He will take every angle correctly. He will just say, like, give me an orb. He'll just go and get a kill. But the downside is this, Sam. This is a key point to understand. So, you can understand when he's on his game, he's not going to want someone restricting him and telling him, like, you go here. Or, like, you're going to work around a pick here. He's going to be like, what do you mean, bro? I'm just going to go and take my shots. But then here's the downside. I heard from people like Stick Hope, who've been teaming mates of this for a long time right you have to sort of like know his problems and get ahead of them so when you notice for example that he's not in the flow of the game and it's not going well and he's feeling he's playing a bit more passively you have to sort of like take the initiative yourself of like right i'll get into it i'll like you know i'll like do an entry that'll get him some space on the map or i'll tell him like follow me and we'll do this like it's like you've got to pick him up so i, I imagine he's just the wrong sort of personality for msl let's be real at this point in time oscar's at the end of his career he's not going to start he's not going to fucking start now learning a new way to play counter strike in a different role like if you sign Oscar you sign an Oscar mate he's a brilliant player but he's at the end of his career like this is the last let's be real like year of his career so I think they're just two people and there's no time left to compromise you'd probably need years to come to around to the same view of the game so I don't think either person's wrong I think they should have a totally different perspective on Counter Strike basically I'm just curious what yeah MSL he's only 27 as well like, oh he's quite young years in the tank that's that why my joke, right. if you remember on the desks, even back in like 2015, 2016, was always that when you saw MSL, and remember at the time, somebody to be like 21, because he already looked like he had the thinning hair that you've already combed over. It's like, I always used to say, he doesn't look like he's just worried about the next round strats. He looks like he's got a fucking mortgage and two kids and like fucking alimony payments. Like, he always did, didn't he? He always looked ridiculous. Like, he's the most ridiculous like journeyman character of all time. Because as you say, you think he's like 35 now or something, don't you? <laughs>
<laughs> uh, it's so bad. It's I mean, it, it bodes well for him at least. The downside of that interview, though, well, he can wa- he can walk it back. I guarantee, because a lot of people are MSL haters, they're just going to take that as gospel and say he's shit. Though, unfortunately, so that's not so great. But whatever. But then, I, but how do you how do you turn it around if you're MSL at that point? Then you can't. The problem that he has is this: um, because the last few projects he's done have been underwhelming. You have to just have results at some point in time. It's like, it's like what Snappy did. Look, everyone now will pretend they always thought Snappy was good. No, it's because Ents got really good results. And like, we're going to the finals. Exactly. That's when everyone magically remembered they loved Snappy. Before that, no one gave a fine fuck about this guy. So I've even told them all this. I've told them, look, man, we can make all the excuses and all the reasons and explanations. Eventually, you have to put some results up. Like, once you put the results up, then the hater can't complain as much, can he? He has to sort of take it as reality. So I think his problem is just like he's had a bunch of like he's had a little bit of bad luck. He's also had some bad teams as well, to be fair. And apparently they weren't getting paid on this one. So it doesn't surprise me. This was a bad project if no one's getting any money. Oh, there's one last detail to mention. I forgot to say as well. The reason why someone like Oscar would especially be annoyed about this is because one, this is the end of his professional career. He is like 32 or 33 years old himself. Yeah. He's, not only is this going to be the end of his professional career, guys, but he actually has a real world family. Like I think he has like a child and a wife or something like. So the other thing is as well, Sam, like he ain't one of these young guys who's sticking around like, oh, well, don't have the money to buy that new like Xbox. Uh, so I'm so dating. I'm saying Xbox as well, like some shit from 30 <laughs> years ago. But whatever, the new <laughs> Xbox, the, and, yeah, the PlayStation that y'all, y'all kids into <laughs> no but basically the joke is like he probably needs that money for rent and stuff man like he's not fucking around remember he's been in that sinners team for a few years i doubt he's got loads of cash stored in the bank so if you don't get paid for months and months that's a big deal like i know what he means by that dude it's like look we're not young guys like i don't want to just join your team sonny because we're cool teammates and mouse like i want to pay my family's way mate like if you if you knew these guys were sauce why are you inviting me i would feel a bit aggrieved at that mark there you go. That's why, and that's probably why he's not really holding back at all in this post in this in this interview where he's just like, yeah, fuck it, throw him under the bus because fuck these guys. They, they, you know, I can see that. I can see that being a thing where there is a, there is a there isn't as much good blood, or you know, it's it's a bit of b- bad blood even between the players now. So that 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 actually popped up, and that was a little bit interesting to catch on to because again, um, good to see some Oscar news, but also a bit of a shame to see that the Titans project is falling apart for MSL MSL sake and the others involved in the project as well. And also, I saw he's just gone back to the Sinners team. So, spoiler, I think you're probably never going to see Oscar again. So, people don't know. The Sinners team, what made them good wasn't just Oscar. They had, like, Neo Frag and those guys that are an OG now. So, they don't have those guys anymore. So, unfortunately, I think this is probably the end of him. Just probably, that was his last chance. Hmm. It's a shame, he's a mega player. Exactly. And then, uh, does he have, like, a stream? Does he do something like Forrest does, where he streams now on the regular, or Kenny, or whatever? Although, Kenny's back on Talkins now, so he's, can you call Kenny a streamer anymore? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, although I see that head tilt, hey, yeah, Falcons, we'll see. You know, could have held out for a better team, perhaps could have maybe done something. But he wanted to go back with the Kingmaker, man. Come on. Am I the only one who just feel like I'm not going to actually allow myself to emotionally invest into Falcons until at least like three months in? Because I have to, the problem is okay. similar. I think there's a world where like a month and a half in the team, he just goes, nah, actually, I'm going inactive again. You know what I mean? Like you don't get the initial results or maybe you're just not enjoying the game as much yourself. Like I have to know that he's actually committed. If he does like three months, then I'll believe it's real. Then I'll believe. This is what we talked about though, that, that with Kenny it was never mechanical. It was always mental. And it's just it's just a question of motivation and whether or not he's feeling the fire to get in there and win. Otherwise, I mean, because he, he can physically do it. I mean, he's got the skills still. It's sure. insane. But uh, yeah, this Falcons, this Falcons team, it's, it's you're still going to have to survive in the hellscape that is the online qualifiers to get into these main events. Oh, you're it's going to be gonna get invites. You're not going to get invites. And so that's a realm that Kenny... Uh, you know, it's like, does Kenny know what he's getting into? Oh, and <laughs> remember, here's the worst part as well. You're not just a normal tier two pro failing to make the event. When you don't make the event, it becomes news as well. So now every time you fail those online qualifiers, HLTV thread, someone memeing like, oh, lol, Astralis, the fucking garbage, you can't make the major. Like, oh, that's the worst part of it. Like, there's a lot of pressure as well when you're in these teams building up. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's what's going to really be interesting to see whether or not he can perform. All right, but like speaking of performance, I mean, I guess we could do some predictions. And also, yeah, it's worth reminding everybody, thanks to our sponsor, yes, esportsbet.io, for making it happen. But uh, you and I, we're going to be doing a watch party for the finals uh, coming up on Sunday for the Blast Fall. So that'll be cool. Do you guys want to hang out? 5.30 p.m. Uh, CET. Which one? Sorry, what was it? 5.30 p.m. CET. Remember, PM. Blast is always just the best of three, guys. That's it. Exactly. So not going to be up until 2 in the morning. Yep. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, just brutal finals. But 
I mean, crossed fingers. It is possible. It is possible that we could actually get a Navi rematch. If they first get first phase. place in their group, Navi phase, Navi phase in the finals. Yes, please. The thank you. What I wanted for the major the entire time and I got robbed, we could actually get it here. Yes. Please. Now the question is like, who wins and if we get there? I mean, dude, I don't know with how FaZe are performing. If FaZe keep up like this in the in the in the playoffs as well, uh, they 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 go up against either FaZe would go up against either Nip or if they lose Liquid in the semifinals. I think FaZe eats whoever's lunch. You know, whoever they are, they they FaZe FaZe murder them. So that you could absolutely have FaZe getting fired up and into perfect shape going into the grand final here. And I don't know if Navi have got what it takes to stop them. What what do you think? I mean, in theory, I agree. Like, if, from what I've seen in the server the last few months and the form Navi's in, they don't. But luckily, they, they always do in this. They've got simple, right? Like, if simple ever just comes out like he should have done at the major and fucking lays the pipe down, then we can have some work. That's the one thing that's been underwhelming about this era of Navi. I don't know if anyone else has felt it. It's like, simple hasn't been bad. He's still had a good year. He's had some very good performances. But he doesn't do the, like, super hard carry that he used to do when the old Navi's that were dodgy. Like, mm -hmm. how come when Navi's having a shit game, he doesn't do it now, mate, where he just drops the 40 bomb and wins the game back for you. It's more like if Navi's good, then he's really good. But if they're not, then he's just average and he so I want to see a bit of the old simple in that sense. Do you think he's 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 getting heavily affected by all this? Because there was news that he did some kind of big donation to some charity. Oh, I saw you donate some money, yeah. And do you do you, I mean do you think that this the, the stuff back home is really messing with his head getting to him? Because I mean we saw that we saw that increase in performance when he got to see his mom, because it turns out he hadn't been able to see his mom for months at a time and I mean, this is a guy who's talked a lot about his family in the past. So clearly, you know, not being able to get to be around his family and just living on the road this entire time is, I mean, it's clearly affected his mental. It's clearly affected his physical. I mean, he's, he's clearly put on weight as well. And so that's just one thing that you have to keep it, keep an eye on. Oh, absolutely. Could be stress could be due yes. to diet, could be drinking a lot. You know, it's like you're living at a hotel rooms, so, you know, having, having lived that lifestyle, you don't have a whole lot else to do apart from, you know, eat hotel <laughs> food and go to the hotel bar. So. Plus, apparently, if people don't know, apparently Simple's on, like, some Ozzy Osbourne shit, isn't he, where he's just barricaded in his hotel room, and he's, like, snorting ants, like, <laughs> the bug's up. life. Let's go. Time to scream. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think I know what you mean, though. I, it's, I've noticed that dip in performance from him that he's not as reliable as he was in the past. It just feel this is it's just so tragic. It's always been an uphill fight, and finally, a team ha like comes together where simple seems like he's finally going to find the team that uh, he can work with. He's got the coach, he's got everything lined up, and then this whole thing kicks off in February between Ukraine and Russia, and uh, and it's just this this drain on this team at the perfect time, like everything culminating, blade years of work, electronic, it, it, everything was there for this Navi roster in the CIS region, and. It just feels like it's just nonstop struggle for them ever since February. It's uh, it's tragic to see because I don't think that simple uh, simple is hitting the level that we're used to seeing because of the fact that he's constantly living on the road and he's constantly being, he's talked to himself about, like I, I guess this is where uh, you can it's not to say they cut him a little bit of slack but he himself like if if he's being scrutinized there's a level of scrutiny that's not uh, because of the war now. There is, uh, you know, he gets judged for everything he says. Because oh, of absolutely. Figure. Yeah, of course. And he put himself in that position where he caught a lot of flack because he called for peace in that speech. And, uh, and, and some people didn't like that. Some people took it against him. And so, you know, he's losing fans on the social media side of things. He's taking heat on social media. So this is a whole nother level to, uh, you know, we're simple. Why you bully me? Those days are gone. He's used to getting loved. And when that love isn't coming anymore, I wonder if that's fucking with his mental You know state. what? That that even puts a different perspective, I will say, on that, like, what was still a fucking whack tweet to those Brazilian fans before the Fury game at the Major. Like, yeah, dude, that's the difference. Simple went from the guy literally saying mad shit, like, see you in hell, Germans, to like, please don't boo me. Not he, yeah. I always say this. Not he didn't say, please cheer for me. He just said, please don't boo me. That actually almost, if you think like you're saying, if you set up the way the whole year's been, that's almost like someone just at the end of their rope is like, oh, it's fucking, at least don't boo me for fuck's sake. Like, you know, cheer yeah. for them if you want, but don't boo me. Come on, man. Like I'm trying. That's almost the vibe yeah. I get from that, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in a similar, like I, I've got a similar read on it. It just doesn't seem, it's not the same. Uh, it's not the same punch. Not the same punchiness from uh, from simple as we've seen in the past. And I, I think this has got to be. It's got to be a part of it.
Plus, I don't look, look I, I actually pondered as to whether or not I'd even make this like a legit opinion publicly, but I think it's worth saying. I think it's a fair point to make. I even think this will sound really weird, but I also think there has been insane pressure on Simple this whole time period. Because remember, if he had won any of these tournaments, PJ Antwerp Major, mm. I am Cologne, this tournament now, this major, you don't think that would have been, in theory, in the movie version of his life. That's the ultimate moment you make the statement, isn't it? That's when you can, like, as a Ukrainian person, you can have the flag, you've won the World Championship. That would be your ultimate state. Imagine the pressure on you to get to that scenario, the pressure to win that match in that case. Like, you're not playing at the same stakes the other guy is. The other guy's just trying to win a match. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's just trying to win the trophy. You're, yeah. you're thinking, I mean, you're in, the, you're in the public eye back home. And, uh, and also... I mean, you have to wonder if if, if they're also catching uh, catching flack for doing what they're doing, right? When you got other guys like Zeus, et cetera, who are going back and who are posting on social media about how you know they're at the front and they're doing they're involved, they're doing all this stuff. You could be you could think that they're also catching flack on that side of things as well. Man, I've even seen people. You might have seen this. I've even seen people on Reddit. So we're talking about the Western audience, similar. Be like, why isn't simple fighting and signing up? It's like, yeah. Mind your own fucking business. None of your, by the way, you are aware, guys, war fucking sucks and none of us will ever know the reasons for the wars. So, like, unless it's literally to defend, like, your village slash home slash family directly, and apparently he doesn't need to do that. He's being able to get out of harm's way. Why would you want this guy to be involved in a war scenario? That's that's just stupid, guys. Like, if anyone can get out of that shit, I would just take advantage of it, mate. And like I say, unless it's literally like the wolf's at your personal door, like, obviously, you're not leaving the house if your own family's in it. But it, otherwise, if it's possible to not participate in wars, I think it's a great thing for everyone to do. Mm. Especially when you have, uh, <laughs> that's the thing. I think that's, that's it occurs to me now that you had zero gravity out there as well who was posting. So it's just like, you got a lot of not V people who are constantly putting it out there, you know, the war, the support, the charities, you know, being there, doing all this. And uh, and so you're going to have that in your in the back of your head. And you've well. got the dickheads and, that we mentioned in the past, the villats of the world who were always pushing the negative angle, the gowlezers of their scene, as it were. Sure. And not only that, I mean, also keep in mind, half of his team is Russian. I yep. mean, you still have Electronic and Perfecto who are in a weird spot where Navi have publicly said that they are not going to work with anybody based out of Russia. And yet... They're still based out of Russia, and I guess we're just supposed to ignore that last statement and also how you, you know, not you're going really hard on this Ukrainian thing, but you still have to play with Electronic and Perfecto, and they're your teammates. You don't, I mean, I, I think it's probably pretty clear that you don't want to see something uh, oh, of bad happen, as, i.e., they get yeeted off the team for, for, for this reason. Do you know what, Sam? I, I know this might sound like a bit out of pocket, but I'm going to speculate it. In my opinion, if Simple wasn't in Navi, I think they would have cut the Russian players. If you just look at what they've done elsewhere, I just think it's logical that if you didn't have to, you would remove anyone that seems like a PR nightmare. The problem I think is this, because Simple is the number one person you need to keep happy in that team. And you know, he recently just signed like, the mega extension yeah, the for your extension or whatever. If I have Simple and I know all the shit he's had to go through for my org, Navi, and he's like, look, I want this fucking electronic guy and I'm definitely keeping a perfecto. You don't, you're not even going to discuss it. You're not going to bring that up. You're going to be like, you know what? Keep Simple happy. Hands off those players. But I do think this is the problem I have is it does imply to me it ends with those two, though. We're not bringing another fucking Russian player in. Because you know it's similar. All the rumors around Navi, not a single one ever contained a Russian player. It yeah. was always Yakindar from Latvia, Buster from Kazakhstan. Now we've got this guy coming out the fucking academy team. Like it was never ever anyone with a Russian identity. So that implies to me, like I think, like you're saying there, I think Simple might not even be playing right now if he didn't have like a team that could win the championship. So in my opinion, it's just like, it's a little bit cynical, but that's why I think Navi doesn't consider kicking those guys, you know, because why would you? Like, if you're Simple, I wouldn't sign for another few years if I don't have these guys. I'm starting over at the beginning again at the bottom of the pile, and then we have to get new teammates and new people who know the ropes. Like, that's a nightmare. No one wants that. Yeah, especially when you could just when you have one of the most popular streams in the scene and you can just pop your stream on and get 10 You could just do six viewers. months. You could, you could wait it out, right? You could just go, you know what? I'm just going to wait it all out. Yeah, you could. It's 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 stuff that like that that doesn't really get talked about, and it's no, something no. that's worth thinking about as well. And it's something that if you're if you're uh, if you're like placing bets is something that you would want to consider in your in your bet in your betting in in your places because uh, th those are factors that are definitely going to have impacts on players. And I think that's it plays a large uh, role in Navi's um, inconsistency throughout the year. They can they can look terrifyingly good, and they can also look mortal. And it's a, it's a real frustrating time how all this is kind of lined up to make this a, a reality that we have to live in but um yeah i mean the thing is right now i'm I'm kind of curious to see because the other hypothetical here is that um navi somehow lose against like liquid 
but then we would get the uh, we would potentially have the semifinal. We would have the final in the semifinals because then at that point you would have Navi going up against uh, Nip in the quarterfinals, and whoever wins that would go on to play against Phase. Whereas Liquid would be the ones you know who are waiting in that bottom bracket, that bottom bracket uh, semifinal, waiting to go up against Heroic or G two. Heroic and G two though, that's an interesting game. That could be really fun. Actually, I'm 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 kind of curious to see. I mean, I think the the pressure is going to be on G two in this one because they still have a lot to prove after that major performance. Whereas Heroic, they should know now. They should have the confidence to know that they can go deep in a tournament. That they they shouldn't be you know fearing anybody uh, before the semifinals or finals. So, like, do you think what do you think about this G2 team so far? Because they didn't look great against Liquid, it was a bit of a touch and go rough one. They lost 16 uh, 14 on Mirage on the second map, so it could have happened, but it just didn't It didn't quite go their way. But like, what do, what do you do? You have a read on this G2 team right now? What we've seen so far across these maps? When I did the betting preview thing for the event with Monty, I actually had G2 beating Liquid, I took the, them as the favorite in that one because I actually do think on paper, f Team Liquid is still a slightly flawed team. Like, I think the Nitro IGL angle hasn't really worked out. Orsi's just average. And then the Kendar thing's hitting miss because he's an entry. Like, you can't be permanently. It's not like being an AWP, you can't just frag out every round, guys. So, the problem I have is I do think they should have been able to beat Liquid. So, when I look at that match, I think most of their players looked pretty bad in terms of form, mate. Like, where the fuck's the modesty that was around? before the RMI that guy was killing the game like mm -hmm. look he might not like win the big semi-final for you but he was fragging out against everyone like each had a very average game I thought so I just thought all in all the G2 teams doesn't look that great so they definitely need to like it cannot be this level if they play this level they'll just go out immediately in that first match Heroic will beat them but I think on paper they also should be able to beat Heroic like the tough thing I think about G2 for me is this it's implied by the fact that like there's this rumour maybe Hunter becomes the IGL and then they're going to recruit someone else as the coach it's implied Hooks is going to get kicked he's like some die young territory now where it's like you're not staying mate like we're replacing no matter what so I also think they're another team that if they just play without the pressure you know this lineup's dead so I think I think it could be this team could be in the final if they had a miracle run they're not a terrible team I think the sad thing is the actual players on paper are really good yeah, just the form like in the server right? think about it yeah like I'm underwhelmed paper. by this roster Total freak, Nico. Freak. I mean, it's still a freak. Like Nico's still one of the guys who's consistently oh, he's a monster. performing the best on the team. So the firepower is there. They have a star opper in a meta where it's like you, if you can have a star opper, you're gonna go, you're gonna do well. Uh, you have a star rifler in Nico. You've got Hunter. You've got you've got uh, JKS as well. You're not expecting JKS to hard carry, but he can still do his role. He can fill his role. No, he's solid. Need. It feels like they should have all of the tools. The question that I was that I was wondering about is whether or not they. <laughs> Not to put it that way, but like whether or not they have a soul, I don't know, or like an identity, I, I something to bring them together as a team and to, to get them focused in a direction, right? Is that does that fall on Hooksy? Does that because you've had the, these constant leadership changes with the team, you've had the coach changes as well, you even have the manager change. So I mean, it's like do, like there's been a lot of change around the roster, and so does the roster know its identity, know how, know how, like what style it wants to play, how it goes about winning, how it goes, you know, how how it goes about competing. Um, and if it's, uh, if it's because again, like you were saying, you know, it's just, uh, it, it sounds to me like we're talking about a lot of mental issues and not mechanical issues because the mechanic on the mechanical side, these guys are monsters. So it has to be mental. So what, what are we trying to boil down here, uh, to get them to perform? Is it, uh, is it a, is it hooksy and IGL? Is it a coach? You know, like what, what is it that we need to change to get results out of this team? Sounds like both. That just seems like the direction they're headed in, right? Yeah. It's uh, it's it's weird. That's why I hope for real they actually are doing that movement because I just gets to come in as a coach and the Balkan boys and bring them back. I, I still just want I just still want them to go all the way. Just you know, you bring Kassad in, bring Yanko as in, uh, in as well. Just have it, just go all the way, fully commit. Uh, you got Kassad and Yanko. You know, coach, assistant coach, whatever. Maybe they're co coaches. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing is, though, on. even though other people will think this is a mad statement to make, I do actually believe it. So I'm going to say it. If if they really do want to do that move, similar where they're going to make Hunter the IGL, I'm not joking. I would absolutely say this to the team. I'm willing to do that, but here are the conditions. If it doesn't work out, you're fired, Nico. I don't care if you're, it's not even about how you play. You're fired if it doesn't work out. Because if I'm going to go through all these fucking IGL changes, coach changes, I'm going to kick Kenny S out of my team so you can even be the opera. Remember that shit storyline? And then you then have your cousin become the IGL and that doesn't work. Like at that point in time, by the way, it's not about you as a player. You might be an amazing player, but someone else can figure that riddle out. Like I'm done with that. I just want to win Counter-Strike matches, right? Because the one problem I have with Nico is this, is I do actually start to wonder, dude, this guy has been around 
around so many different teammates now. Why do they all go to shit around him? Do you know what I mean? He plays great. He gets his frags off great. But man alive, everyone else seems to just degrade around him because the difference between him and Simple, in my opinion, is this. Simple genuinely had some very flawed players, the Edwards and the Zeus's of the world. Nico nearly always has players on paper who look great. Like, you look yeah. at the phase roster, you're like, how are they coming, like, seventh? You look at this roster, dude. This roster on paper should be like guaranteed top four this tournament. Look at it. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, dude, the worst non-IGL players, JKS, and his job even is like classic, like anchor type roles that he's good at. Like th this should be a slam dunk. So like eventually you do have to ask the question. It's not, is Nico a bad player? This is a separate topic completely. It's like, what if, what impact does he have on his teams though? Because I do get the sense, not just from how he appears on camera. He doesn't seem like he's a good like morale builder in the team, if you know what I mean. Like I don't get the vibe if you play with Nico, you're like, awesome, we're going to win. We've got Nico. If anything, you're like, actually maybe he'll do great and then I'll be called out for being shit or something. Like, I think I think it's a totally different dynamic. So as much as it might sound harsh, like, look, Faze would have made you without an equal, so you can't be done. Like, if you if he wants to go and play with whoever he wants, let him go, mate. Just let him go. Let him go. This is the this is the complicated thing, though, about bringing blood onto a team. The, first, the, oh, it the is. second I heard that Hunter was coming on, I was like, oh, boy, this is this is worse than a friend. This is, you know, you're bringing family onto a team. How are you going to work around the dynamics there? This is, I mean, it was the other way around. He joined Hunter's team, but yeah, I know what you mean. But you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's just that's that kind of uh, bond. That's that kind of uh, potential complication that you don't you just don't want on a team. I don't know. I just can't see it. No, I no. In my opinion, I think it's really bad. And it's not the fault of either people, by the way. I just no, think it's, of course I just think not. It's, a, it just, it's, it's like you're saying, it, it just adds an unnecessary that dynamic that you don't need in the team. In Why it, are you, you taking know? that risk? Hmm. Hey, there's one more team that I want to talk about before we, uh, before we answer some questions. And uh, that's Nip, first impressions, man. I mean, okay. it looked real spicy against Heroic there for a second. Yeah. I.e., I thought they were just going to get... Uh, it was not looking like a... Um, you know, it's like a 16-13, real close on Inferno. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. It's still your map pick. You had to work really hard to get it. Uh, and, you know, like when I was watching, I was like, oh, okay. I mean, it didn't feel like they were dominant or anything, but okay, fine, fair enough. And then they get blown out, completely blown out on Ancient and then on Overpass. 16-6, 16-4. Just annihilated. Not even close, not even competitive. And Ancient not a is not a really good map for Nip right now, it feels like, because they've also, they also really struggled to put it away uh, versus OG in their second series. A double overtime win on ancient so for like it's not it's not it's clear that they're not comfortable on the map but they got utterly annihilated on overpass after that and uh barely scrape a win against og double overtime on the first map and then 16 10 on the second map so like do we have enough to go off of here for this nip do we have a, do we have enough to make a read on this team because they got you know they just got destroyed at our at rio so we don't have a lot to go off of there and uh we only have four maps to go off, well, five maps to go off of here uh, so far this tournament. So what, what do you think about Nip right now, first read? The problem is, like, either it's not going to work or it hasn't powered up yet. Those are the only two alternatives. Because when I look at this squad at the moment, like, the really disappointing thing is, I thought at a minimum, a bit like the old Nip before they got Lexi B, they'd always be in the matches because of how good the rifles are. Like, in yeah. theory, raw rifle fragging should always be there for Nip. It always was this year, people remember. But actually, that's an area where they've been a bit underwhelming. Like, where the fuck is Brolan? Brolan's supposed to be the guy where if you're Lexi B, it's like, bro, I'm here to win and you're going to be a top 20 player. That's what we're doing here, bro. That's the whole point of this setup. Like, he hasn't really performed, you'll notice. And he was the big sign and they brought in. Generally, sure. the team just looks all right. That's the problem. Because I also, by the way, there's another one I got wrecked on. I also picked Nip to win this match against the Rock. I thought they were going to win as an underdog. Now, I did it, obviously, because they had a huge odds. But, like, I also, yeah. I'm, like, I'm actually a bit of a heroic hater. I think they're a bit overrated, personally. So, I thought this was a perfect chance to, like, when they won that first match, I was thinking, brilliant. Maybe they steal the Series 2-0 and I look like a genius. But, sadly, they got mega wrecked, as you say. And got <laughs> nah, dude, that's you like didn't get zero, scenario. literally. But it felt like they could get almost no fucking in CT rounds and spoiler CT rounds are largely about skill like it's about can you shoot people with the guns so that was a bit disturbing I am I'm not out on them completely because I don't think Alexi B it's going to take time still to build up the team but the the players have to play better like they, these players are much better than the performance they played in that match you'll talk about against the Rogue they were whack in that one Dude, they, it was it was rough to watch I was I it, and each it was really ropey on Inferno too it wasn't like that was a you know, okay, decisive rounds and everything. There was some, there was some real weird rounds there. It just, it just looked scrappy from start to finish. And so already, you know, it's like, okay, cool. They picked up the first map. Fair enough. Interesting. Uh, you know, this is because, oh yeah, no, I remember now like that the, they started super cold. 
where they were just getting beaten up. And I'm like, oh boy, is this nip thing not going to work out at all? And then they managed to start getting some rounds going for themselves and it turned into a bit more of a match. But I remember nips like they started really cold and I was like, oh shit, you know, this, maybe this, maybe this roster is a bust, you know, within like the first six rounds of Inferno, I was just like, oh, you know, is, is it more of Rio? Have they not made any progress since? Oh shit. But they, uh, they at least made that a three mapper. But like, if I'm just looking if at a glance, again, if you're just looking at rating right now, Rez is their top guy with 1.12. Everybody else is <laughs> no okay. To be fair, Hampus is uh, above one oh as well. He's at one oh six, but everybody else is sub one. As I say, it's the Brolin question. Where the fuck is where Brolin? is Brolin? Brolin. And what do you have to do to get him? You're supposed to be the star. Is it because? But again, is it? Do you think that was a cop out that he said that he wanted to speak with? He wanted to play with Swedish players as a way to just get out of that uh, fanatic. You know, I think it's absolutely thing? was cause. Yeah. So do you, it's you also like let's be real as well. To do that it? just can't be a thing anymore. Like. Sweden, that ship sailed. There aren't the players to make an all Swedish team that will be world class. Like, put it this way an all Swedish team will be on the level Nip is now. So, what's the point? You may as well gamble and go on to be a great national team. So, I look, I do feel sorry for Brolan in this sense. No other Swedish players in history had to do this. They, they get rights to the forests, all these great players, they sit all off crims. They could all just chill in their teams as players Swedish the whole career. But that's just not the world we're in anymore. Like, sadly, CSGO is becoming like daughter. We're going to be all these international rosters and we're going to have red occasional really good regional teams but it'll be it'll be either scenarios like outsiders like you're off and just the same region yeah, speak it's the same language. CIS. yeah CIS so, will still have region realistically or, or brazil or whatever might just keep theirs but you know like aside from that in my opinion almost every country is going to change like denmark obviously can hang around a bit longer but everyone else has to change it's just reasonable so like i do feel sorry for him but i also just need to see some fucking counter-strike eventually mate. like you you're here to frag yeah that is the mad uh I, mean, I think it doesn't feel like they really can catch a break with him at all. And then Hampus is also like Hampus has some really strong maps, but then he also kind of drops off because it's interesting because he is kind of he was for a moment there. It looks like he is kind of proving that uh, that trend wrong, i.e. that IGLs can't get back up to uh, to a high level. Like once you take over the IGL role, if you were a fragger before, you don't really ever get back up to that level. You know, the thing. obvious jokes of it writes itself. Well, it was a shit IGL one. You remember last year when they couldn't win any fucking T rounds? They used to, they used to win like 12-3 on CT side of Inferno. They'd be like, all right, then, better, better yeah, squeeze yeah, out really a 16-40 there, guys. <laughs> like, the joke is that's why similar because he knew what you're talking about. So he never actually allowed himself to be a true IGL. He was like, you know what? I'm only going to ever dedicate 1% of my brain to IGL in. So like, there we that's go. how he kept that's the it. skills. He didn't, whereas, he didn't have the notes. Oh, he whereas have everyone knows paper, back in the day, the color coding and the you know the underlining. Shocks did actually ruin his whole fucking game by being IGL for a year or whatever. Like super team, didn't he? He never came back from that guy. He, he never, never did come back. back. Oh shocks! Well, hopefully he comes back and we get him onto a team. I don't know, man. It's just I don't know if the only problem with that summer is eventually the turtle. Eventually it becomes a bit laughable because all I'll, all I'll tell you is this summer next year. The year is going to have a three on the end, right? Similar, when Shoxy became the best CSGO player was in 2013, mate. Like, when it's 10 years ago, listen, I, I will hold out to the end, but part of me is like, just go without me, guys. Leave me behind. <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead without me. I'll only hold you back. Me in existence is Shoxy is staying back here. We're going to make another team. 2024 is our year. Like, but Shoxy's yeah. a god. We can't, we, can't, we can't get rid of him, man. You know what's fucked up as well? I actually realized this the other day. We're at the point now where since the scene's just never going to do what I want. I'm actually at the point business-wise where maybe I just maybe I just solo fund existence to come back to CSGO. Like, <laughs> I, I, I surely could just pay it at this point in time. What, what does it cost? Like 100K? I, I, could, I could chip in, you know. Let's get a, a team going. Nation, exactly. Nation mission here. Exactly. There we go. We get a team going. I like it. And pirate, to be fair, it'd be great. Pirate booty. It would be a great like sponsor opportunity for the major because if you've ever seen existence at majors, he usually was last place and with a very free team. Free <laughs> as fuck. Amer <laughs> American to the bit rend. There, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you think it's a good time for questions? Yeah, let's do it. Questions. All right. We'll, uh, we'll shift over. Uh, so these are going to be uh, some of the questions. Thanks, everybody, also for, uh, you know, if you've made it this far, uh, I hope that you're subscribed. If you aren't, please consider subscribing. And also uh, leave a comment or a, or a like or any of that sort of thing as well. That's obviously how I like to hear the like to like to see the comments, like to read the comments. I read the comments every time, so good to see you guys down there. And uh, thanks for taking part. But uh, as far as the questions are concerned, here these are for Grog Coin holders. And so if you're interested in that, uh, you can check in the links below in the description, and the, it'll tell you how to join our Discord server. And on the Discord server, there's a Grog Coin lounge that has instructions on how to get Grog Coin. And if you hold Grog Coin. You hold enough of them that supports the show, and also you get to ask questions each week for the show. So, hopping right into it, let's see what do we got. We got Zumba. 
There is that list on Twitter that showcases pro players, streamers failing at the most basic aspects of life. What is the funniest story like that you have heard or witnessed? Well, that's, I mean. Oh, I think I know what he's referring to. I think it's the list by, right off the top of my head, Sam, I think it's by this guy, this Portuguese guy from League of Legends who works with LEC called Chikares. He had a list where it was like, I think this is what this guy's referred to. It was basically a list of like funny tweets where pros, as he says, just this is from through the years, by the way. It's not like they're all contributing to a project. He's collecting this all. He made like a list of tweets that essentially, like you guys says, shows that like a lot of esports pros like can't even like run their own life. Like, you know, like they couldn't like arrange a taxi, like they can't do their washing, and they fuck up like how to make the computer. I assume that's what he means. So what was the premise behind this? Like assuming that what? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's it. That is the, it's just like, do you have any stories? Oh, of, uh, there must be some good ones here. You must know some of this. If people don't know, pro players are like, I've said it before, you know, I have that rule where for every pro player, take five off his age and you'll have his actual like maturity age. They're like that. Like, dude, the number of pros who can't do basic things like install a graphics card, like do their taxes. Oh, it's outrageous the amount of things. They're, they are like teenagers at some level, aren't they? Well, I mean, dude, I, I remember seeing that one that that was disgusting, actually, where it was the um, I think they were going to the cloud nine house for the League of Legends team, where there was literally garbage up to knee height in some of the rooms because okay. the players just weren't taking it out. It's all just fast food wrappers, oh, empty Coke bottles, it's just all garbage, just straight garbage. And these guys couldn't be asked to. to Who do they think them. they are? Simple or something? <laughs> exactly there you go there you go there was mold around the vents and the ventilation it was really weird man it was gnarly but like i have heard of horror stories like that where it's just where it's just like holy shit could you imagine trying to live in that in those scenarios fuck that it it could also be a reason why cs there was never any team houses because players just couldn't uh uh, couldn't handle being. I mean, to be it. fair, we have also, we even talked about this at the beginning of the episode. Isn't Smoothie the ultimate example? It's like you can't eat with a knife and fork. Yeah, like, no, that is. Guys, true. I'm not making it that hard, am I? I'm like, <laughs> to, at this point, to defend Smoothie, you have to be on some sort of like, that is a heteronormative standard of like, give me a break. Like, it's a knife and fork, you twat. Just pick it up. Look, see that? See the bit with all the like trident end? Like, like you remember like in the Little Mermaid? <laughs> stab that. Stab the food with that. Now, when you stab it, you can hold it, can't you? See that part that's like, almost like a little sword use that like a cut, <laughs> cut the leg off look yeah oh, that one oh, you can eat that chicken mm. no, not the bone. Mm, delicious like dude i think that's <laughs> it's ridiculous <laughs> delicious, dude i don't think i think that's i think that is out of like the public stories that might have that's to outrageous, isn't it? I, I literally off the top of my head i can't think of anything Anything that's close to that in terms of, I mean, apart from the living in your own garbage, like that, that really is fun. Also, because here's the problem. This is where similar. Some people have very different personalities. The reason people know that story is because Richard, I think even maybe did an interview or something, he referenced it. And obviously that won Richard over because that made Richard feel sorry for him. It just made me think of Smooey as even more of a ridiculous character that can't be a real person. That makes it sound like when he's eating dinner and all bigger in a restaurant, he's out back like Lady in the Tramp or something, just eating off a grill. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> him and Zantara is just <laughs> the, the, the meatball or some other. <laughs> and when they were both in big back in the day, yeah, 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 that was them out back, right? Because that was both of them had the same problem. Neither of them spoke German, and they were just stuck in a team. Where I'm not joking, Sam. I don't know if you know this story, but just before Smoo, or maybe it was after him, they had that guy like Locker in the team who came out and did a twit longer. And he, bit, by the way, he was German, and even he said that being in big was having people just like screaming in your face over mistakes. So you can imagine, by the way, if you're from some other country like Turkey, UK, you go to this team and you're like, right, well, obviously I'm gonna have to try really hard because I don't know the language. It's just people, ironically, <laughs> just screaming in German <laughs> that you're doing mistakes. In a military style environment, like no, no, join him up. Dude, I can't handle that. Like, I wouldn't even be able to stay my head in the game. Like, what the fuck is this? I mean, like, Das Boot or something. Get me the fuck out. I, I can't do this. And then, obviously, the joke is, you're already getting all that shit over, like, the fucking game where you don't know strats and complicated smokes. And they're trying to do all deep tactical. Remember, they used to be really good with the utility and big. And after that, they're wondering why you can't get it all. Then they go and have dinner. Like, what is... What is this? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, are you doing? This shit, bro. Like, they're just gonna kick you out the team immediately, aren't they? Like, what are you? What the fuck's this shit for? Like, what's just a little? That's a, that's <laughs> a spoon, bro. That's a spoon. I know. That's a spoon, bro. I know. What the fuck? I'm out. I can't handle it. <laughs> that might be the worst one. You're right, because no, normally it's just minor stuff. They can't do like normally adult stuff. <laughs> I can't in it. Like, imagine that one's mental, though. I can't believe that. 
<laughs> no, that, that really does have to take the cake. All right. Uh, cheesecake enthusiast. What are the criteria you guys use to evaluate the greatness of a coach manager in sports and esports? Well, cheesecake, I think we kind of, we might have actually kind of, I mean, answered this question already earlier. At least we talked quite a bit about blade and his system on Navi and just his, his, just the breadth of his experience throughout CSGO throughout the years. I mean, over a decade worth player now coach has a system clearly can reproduce the system with different players as well. It's not like he just has this one team and that's it. You know, he's winning everything. He's, he's changing players in this team and still getting results. He's still got people with like a recognizable style. I feel, I feel like you you just have to judge by blade. Now he's won a major, you know, it's just, it's going to be hard to, to, to beat glaive uh, not glaive uh, blade because I guess it, I mean, maybe it's a shot at Zonic in, in a sense, because, we're still waiting for Zonic to reproduce those results. So if he is this, this God tier coach, right. Who's got it all figured out. Uh, we're still waiting on him to reproduce those results with different players. And, and that hasn't been the case. Whereas with blade, he's, he's just progressively getting better. It seems. What do you, uh, what do you think? Like, basically you sort of nailed it there. Cause obviously you can't directly know what they're seeing. I mean, even when you get to see those like vlogs and stuff, it's still edited what they choose to put in, what they don't. You can't really know what a coach is saying, what he told the player, how he instructed them. So what I would say is this, logically the only way you can get a sense is by inference, isn't it? You have to infer what they might be doing. So you said it there, like essentially how you do it. You have to do things like control group test, like look at when they don't have a player, how he plays, what he does. When they do have the player, how he plays, what he does. Then wait until this is why it doesn't work with one team. It's why in my opinion, opinion people's take on zonic is actually potentially the most wrong we don't know yet because it was one set of five players or if you include care it was six players he was working with in his greatest ever period someone like blade he's working with all different players over the years he's led different players he's had them when they're young at their career he's had them at the peak of their career you also want to test other stuff like you want to see does he bring in one player that doesn't seem like they have a certain style and then in his team they get that style and they become good like one thing i've always thought's mad underrated in counter-strike teams is great Great teams. There's a quality. I once made a video on this topic. There's a quality where whatever the team as a whole is good at sort of becomes part of how every player plays in the team. So the example I would give is like, you know, two of the all-time great clutch teams was obviously like this classic Astralis with Magus and Dupree and Device. But the other one was the old SK gaming team with like Fallen and Fur and Cl Yeah, right? there you go. When you watch these teams play and they're winning every late game situation, you would think they're all just clutch as fuck. But when you take those players apart and put them on different teams, like remember when like Taco went to Team Liquid and then Cold Zero was in phase and then they're like, when you split them all apart, but some of them aren't even necessarily clutch. They're just okay players. Like, so I think that's what shows me that, that, that the team has some sort of coherent style. They have like a system that you learn where you fit within it. You learn like what the, almost like what you were saying earlier, but like a, a, a mental version of that, like a flow chart idea of like, right, when these things happen, I know that my coach likes us to respond in this way. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of those things come from. Like I always give the example for Navi to give people an actual tangible example they can go and watch. If people know the old Navi with Zeus and Edward, where Zeus was a true IGL had a lot of control, right? They were a really good team. And they were even, if people don't know, they were a bit like James' team. They used to run the clock down all the way and get into set. But even so, one of the things that team was famous for was having times where the cohesion of the team just failed completely. And someone like Edward would just make a massive mistake or Zeus would just get fragged and obviously didn't come it properly and just got killed too early, right? The difference is when you watch the team that Blade runs now, mate, even when they're not like the, in the best form, they have like a coherence about the team that's really impressive to watch. Like the way they take sights when they're on like T-side, the speed they go at. When they're on CT, the disciplined way they'll like hold a crossfire together. Like that doesn't come from players. Players are all over the place. Like that comes from someone watching you properly like how i want you to play together like this is the this is the decision making of what you do when something happens in the game so a lot of it is guesswork but what i would say is you can sort of make an informed guess basically yeah if there's if like the the main one that i that i like following is just that uh can you repeat the results with different players and yes and, and if i um yeah and that, that's again just to reiterate the point that i made earlier i.e when boomich was off the team and people are going like, oh, no, what are they going to do without an IGL, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, the IGL never left. Like, yes. <laughs> you know, Boomich is not some deep IGL. You know, he can maybe call here and there or whatever, but the real guy, the brains of the system here is Blade. So long as you got Blade, you're good. 
And um, and that's why, in my opinion, when people say about like Carrigan, like, but he doesn't have the majors of the others. Yeah, but here's what Carrigan has that none of the others, nobody has anywhere close to the resume that Carrigan does of different players, though. That's the thing, Samla. He did it with like the fucking the original Astralis core, then with the Nico Olaf Rain core, then he came later to like Mouse with fucking. I had Rops and Frozen and mm-hmm. Boxy. Mm-hmm. Now we come to a different phase with Twists and Brokey. Like, mate, that's what, no one's done something like that. Like, look, you can agree. If you want to say, is he the best at winning tr- trophies? Thus far, no. But in terms of, like, impact as an IGL, he has one of the most ironclad cases you'll ever see. What an, what an amazing... Tra- the joke is, it's only him. He's the only connecting factor. And if anything, if, if it continues... If they continue to try and find a happy medium with coaches where coaches can continue to have a say, right? Where you find that happy medium between what the community wants and what Valve wants. I mean, who's to say that Kerrigan doesn't retire and just would go on to become one of the oh, great coaches logical, well? would, yeah. Like, if false. any of the players could, you would think yes. that Kerrigan, Kerrigan would be one of those guys. Absolutely. So it's, it's really interesting times and if you look at the future of what Counter-Strike holds, for sure. All right, Hanoda, what will be the next op nerf triggered by Kenny S? <laughs> Because <laughs> if people don't know, like something mad, like a couple of days after it was announced, Kenny S joins Falcons. Valve was just like, um, cut the number of off bullets ball- in half. Like, w- why? Because <laughs> that's one thing no I can't reason. handle, dude. It's like, it's like that makes Valve devs seem like some noob who just joined the public stuff. Like, what the hell? He's camping. That's unfair. Like, uh, sir, that's actually, uh, that's the op. He's just holding a bit angle. T- too many bullets in that gun. That- <laughs> that's unfair. <laughs> What are you talking about, you noob? It's fucking... T- you know how many years we're in? We're like 20 plus years in the couch, right? You're fucking up nerfing. What are you on? Is this shit? I know. We're going to be. We're gonna talk about that. Um, yeah, yeah week, we'll do all the next That has a lot to do with uh, the Blast World Finals as well. Yeah, obviously it wasn't applicable to this tournament if people don't know. They're not doing it at Blast Fall Finals. Exactly. For that patch. This, this, so we'll, this we'll get that Blast one later. Finals is happening on this patch. on a No, not a, on the old patch, I guess, because now the game has been updated to the new M4A1S. They've made some changes there. They made changes to the op, and they've uh, changed the map pool as well with Anubis. But we're going to talk about that next week because uh, that's when World Finals will be on that patch. And I have, I have. All right, Sam, I'll give you a real that. answer. It's a stupid answer, and I'm being purposely facetious. But fuck it, Valve does this anyway, so I'll just say it. Right? Obvious next nerf is this: to stop people doing boring things like saving, like Jim does. The next nerf should be the AWP is the only gun that can't be saved. I mean, logically, if it's so OP, Samler, it's the most OP gun ever. We've had to nerf the fuck out of it, nerf the movement, nerf the speed, nerf the amount of bullets in the clip, never the increase money. the kill feed, never make anything, but never even raise the price, lower the price or whatnot. So if it's this OP, logically, why do you get to save it? Just make, make someone have to fight the way out of the scenario with the AWP. There you go. Make it I did it facetiously, but fuck it. If we're going to let, well, let the world burn. There you go, Valve. Let the world burn. <laughs> All right, Architect Korean Esports based Joe. Why do you think NA talent like Tens and Som did not work out in both CSGO and Valorant? By the way, the, the most hilarious part about that is when he put didn't work out in Valorant. Because if you don't know, Tens was probably like the best player in the world like a year ago or something, mate, or something like that, you know? Like, so I, what he means is like, he's not as good now. Like, the idea they didn't work out is so ridiculous. Like the Som guy barely even gave it a try, guys. He was only here for what, like a year during the online period and then just fucked off. And then as far as I know, in Valorant, I think he's one of those people who didn't have the heart for it, just sort of semi gave up and became a streamer or something. And then on the tens angle, his was just, he didn't try for long enough in CSGO. He was only briefly in the game, if you remember. He's in like that Cloud9 team with like fucking daps or whatever at the end of like 2019, if you remember briefly off the top of my head. And then what happened was he switched to Valorant. And by the way, it became a very good player in Valorant. It was like the main player they were playing around in the Sentinels team. It's just that that team itself hasn't remained good. And in fact, a quick aside, if no one knows Valorant, the Sentinels team in Valorant is the problem in NA that always happens in Counter-Strike, where they make a lineup of really skilled players. And then they think, well, fuck all that tactics and all that high gel noise we just the boys just frag out don't they and the problem with that style always in history is because it's the most reductive style ever that like you're just going to brute force your way through every game it either works because your players are good enough or if your players drop even that much it doesn't work at all and so as you can see they just went down hill down hill down and it's now basically now they've like made the big moves to maybe change so i would just say they just didn't try long enough in csgo like these are both players with talent they both had skills i remember eye test looked interesting I w- listen 
I don't think people go too far. Like they were never like gods or anything, but they look like they could have been good players. I would have been interested to see how they would develop. They could have been German pros. The they problem are. is as well in CSGO, we just don't have that same scene. Like in CSGO, you don't go from nothing to the top team to win the world. Like I know we did because of weird players like Bit got to do that in Navi, but that's very rare. CSGO is more like a ladder. You've got to like win the small lands, get in the get into the top 20, cause an upset in an online qualifier, go to an RMR, maybe make it, maybe don't. Then next year you get into a pro you know, normally you go like one level at a time doing so their problem is they didn't pay their dues they were there for like what six months a year they didn't do it they didn't I mean, do it long enough Psalm was making his uh making his appearance at flashpoint wasn't he he was in gen g yeah yeah that's exactly it so i mean like it, it's it's that's that's not long ago, no it's fairly right? time especially during the online era because that then that that headed into the online era so extremely difficult yeah I think that's the thing. You know, it is a bit maybe a tall ask for the North American players because you know you saw pro, you saw pros who just didn't want to make the commitment that some of these other guys have made, i.e., sure. Elijix and Naf. You know, who are staying in Europe and living out of hotels or apartments for nine months out of the year, uh, because this is where the competition is happening. And some players opted out. Ethan opted out. He was he was on EG. And he said he didn't want to live that lifestyle. And so he goes over to Valorant, where the league is based out of North America, and you're just going to be able to be a Valorant pro and and do your thing there and not have to travel to Europe and live remote uh, for most of the year. So some players just didn't want to do just didn't want to have to deal with that North American lifestyle. And that is kind of one of the things that uh, that they have to deal with now, uh, given the the lay of the land, how there's no no real North American tournaments to compete in, and there's no real North American up and comers right now until somebody decides to step in and maybe like you said do a region lock or something like that where you have just a a north american tournament to, to compete in so but yeah I, I agree with you uh paying dues paying dues is definitely a thing it yeah it's tough for north america because again also valorant streaming you know tens has got a big stream if i remember correctly so um if you go into valorant that's where you're going to get a lot of viewership because you know csgo not the thing anymore so just one of those things all right, BZ, what position on each map, CT side, makes or breaks the defense? Nuke outside, Mirage steps, and should be targeted. Does this change depending on personnel? Oof. Well, here's the thing. Technically, if you go to, I think it might be on the Twitter of that Nero guy who does a lot of stats stuff. He had actually a post yeah. that was like a month or two ago. You'll know what I'm talking about, where it was like mm -hmm. all the CT spots on all the maps, like which ones just by raw rating of all players, like how they perform. So essentially what it showed you was like in the current meta, what like the weakest and the hardest spots are basically. So I, I forget which it was, but like there was some that were actually surprising. Like off the top of my head, I think, for example, outside on Nuke now is actually a really good fragging position. Whereas, you know, back in the day, CT outside of Nuke yeah. used to be death. It was like you're either God or Opera, you just get bodied all day long. Whereas now that's actually a position because people know how to play around smokes with help, where you actually can get tons of frags, believe it or not. So there's some of them were even surprised. So I would just say, go and look up. By the way, it's a good Twitter account follow anyway. He's not tweeting like edgy opinions. He's got loads of stat stuff. Go to Nero CS on Twitter. I forget if it's with a zero or an O. I think it's with a zero, yeah. Maybe a zero there. Basically, just go follow that guy. He, he posts a lot of this stuff quite commonly. And I remember he had something along those lines. So that'll be better than us answering it, put that way. Yeah, actually, that's a, that is a perfect answer to the situation because he actually has the data on it as well. It's not just a, an eye test or a situation. So I really like the work that he's doing. It's super cool to see him um, getting um, getting more attention because I feel like every article that he's releasing right now is a banger, just gold. Really fun to really fun to read. Very a lot of insight. Good work, good work to Nero. Really shout out to him. Yeah, he's doing a great job. All right, it's Young Badger. Is it always a bad idea to revisit a past relationship? I this I, I assume think, he means romantic in this sense, I, but I, the yeah, implication is yeah. What do you think on that? What's your take? I think that um, I, I really think that it, it depends on relationship. Like how did how did the relationship end, and what were the circumstances that it ended? Uh, there are certain things that are just like no go, where you just know it's not going to work, and so don't. Uh, By the way, I'm a, just for the sake of the convenience of the question, I'm assuming he, essentially what I took from that separate is he's implying like a failed past romantic yeah. relationship, right? Essentially, do you think about it? Do you go back to it? Do you revisit? Do, do you think it's good or bad or what? Personally, I don't. I don't think that you do. I think that there's a reason why it ended, and that you just you're supposed to move on at that point. Um, but the reason, but that's the thing. I still feel like there there's caveats. There's there's you can still have because I know of other relationships. So I know of I've like I I can think of a friend's relationship off the top of my head where you know they 
they it did like it, it just didn't work out in terms of timing in their lives where they were when they were first dating you know then they you know they come back and they reconnect a few years later and pick it up again and, oh and okay great, right Fair enough. so you know it's it's like sometimes it's just timing like where they couldn't do the long distance uh, relationship or whatever but then right uh sometimes you know so that's why i say like circumstance i think is important but obviously we're not saying like oh you know she you know it's like she or he i like, because obviously both sides can be fucked up in certain cases you know do, does something fucked up at that point i think it's like eh, yeah no maybe not you know just you know, put that to rest and move on and um uh, and and go from there unless of course there's like extraneous circumstances but again this is all just like super nuanced you have to know the person what's your history what's the track record what's the circumstance what's the context of how things went but I guess as a rule, I would say move on unless you have a very good reason not to. Uh, yeah, I would basically say if it ended in a bad way, which is, I, like I think is implied, that's what he means by a past relationship, because spoiler, if it was a brilliant relationship, oh, well, great, then why would it be a problem? You'd just go back and enjoy it, wouldn't you? But what I would say is this, Samuel, it's actually another area to make an abstract point that I actually think modern technology is not only really dangerous and harmful, but it's going to get way worse in the future. So, like, basically, I think it's actually terrible that everyone now has all these photographic devices and has a million photos and messages and memorabilia about their relationship with people, which by definition are supposed to be fleeting. They're supposed to be things where you enjoy the time you're physically with them. That's why you think of them when they're gone. The absence makes the heart grow fonder. You're supposed to have all that like natural dynamic going in your relationship. So the problem is this, when you break up with them or they leave you or they break up with you or whatever, it's going to be tempting, isn't it? To go back every now and then when you're wallowing and feeling pity and go and look at those messages and remember the nice messages they burnt and then look at the bad messages and look how it ended and, and think like a game, like what could I done differently and all could I have done this and well what did she really mean when she said that though maybe I like misunderstood it or so you could do all that you could go look at photos and torture yourself the reason why I think that is really harmful is because imagine if you couldn't do that by the way me and someone grew up in the world where you couldn't before computers and before everyone else in the world where you can't this is actually a blessing you know the fact that when you don't think about someone and you're not around them and you don't see them remember out of sight out of mind is the saying in English right when you don't see people you do forget about them your heart does start Start to actually gradually forget them. You do start to forget aspects of them and think about it. And whatever your current reality is becomes your world. You're not thinking about the past as much or whatever. I think it's actually really negative that people can like sort of like tunnel and just get lost in like a fucked up world. It's almost like a drug addiction or something. They're just like, they're just going off into this, like they know it's not good, but it's like to soothe themselves. Because essentially I'll tie it into what I think is really dark, which is, you know, that shit you see online now where they're trying to get convince you. Like if you're feeling under like depressed, or under the weather just talk to our ai bot and pretend it's a human spoiler in the future they will i'm oh, telling you right now they will offer you services where they'll do stuff like you feed your chat logs with your ex-girlfriend into a ai and it will just like pretend to be your ex-girlfriend be like sorry it didn't work out with us honey but you know maybe it would have been like i guarantee they're going to do some evil shit like this dude and no, again no, this, to me that's just... dark as fuck i think that's terrible for humanity no the one that that i heard of that really fucked with me and that that this has been used in the in this has been it's like uh, it was used by reddit i believe right where they had uh angels it was there there oh, what did they call it fuck basically if somebody if instead of deleting somebody or uh instead of uh, banning them or deleting their account what they would do is that without telling you they would they would put you into an echo chamber and so if you're uh they they would put you into an echo chamber with bots who would do nothing but agree with you and so so it would so be the opposite of my twitter experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but just think about that right <laughs> i so think i got the, i think they put the setting wrong on mine screaming into the void <laughs> he, in this in, so you're just screaming into the void nobody hears you and you're just like you feel lonely because why doesn't anybody hear me or agree with me or anything like instead, that instead it's like it's going on an episode opposite. of hitchell tv confirmed it's just three guys just bored <laughs> yeah, well, you, 24 you, you, you get the Dude, short guy. <laughs> holy shit or most analyst desks these days to be fair <laughs> i know it agrees with one another but uh oh like, mate no, when a pro player goes on the analyst desk like nowadays some of those cocks because may as well be like Oh, really, Mr. P really, you can that? What else? Like, give me a break. Like, you're supposed to be there to talk as well. You can't. Why are you doing this? I, I better see some so emotes sleep made over. out of that. You better screenshot that. Somebody better screen that. Oh, That's got to be a new emote in the Discord. That's a new emote, yeah. But <laughs> that haunts us. Then. <laughs> but, dude, like, dude, can you imagine that sort of scenario? That's the future. Oh, where not. instead of, like, you will just be put into a little echo chamber where you have a bunch of people who agree with you or you think. And in fact, you're just screaming into the void. You won't even know that you're living in a parallel universe where you're just, you're just shadow banned completely. Here's the and thing, Sabla. For all we what know, a nightmare. 
for all we know, this explains my whole career. What actually happened is, in an alternate timeline, I committed a crime in the future, Semler. And my prison sentence was they sentenced me to be an esports journalist. But I had, like, the curse of Cassandra. I would always tell the truth, but I would be considered a universal liar. And I'm trapped in this uh-huh. domain where they're all just telling me I'm a liar 24-7. I, I think it happened to me. I think I know what's going on there. I think it's- now, I'm putting it, but now you know. you're going to just, is are you just going to unravel now because you're going to start questioning everything, all your reality? Well, the joke is, I'm going to be the first person, Semler, to opt into the project you're talking about because actually the idea of being trapped in an echo chamber where people <laughs> do disagree, that sounds great that sounds like a vacation to me I'll, I'll, can i get into hey, this I can i skip the line <laughs> <laughs> Dude, can you imagine? Like, that's actually such a trip, though, because you're going to go into this future where you could be trying to communicate with people online no, and you're never up. actually communicating with yeah. anybody. And then you're going to question all of reality because everything is going to be tied into the Internet at all times. The Internet yep. of Things and just everything happens online now. And it could all be uh, deep fake AI or whatever. Oh, dude, fucking hell. Oh, mate, it's, it's going to get worse than that. Like, think of the stuff now. You know, when you go now and you do a tweet, you'll have seen this. Every now and then when you do a tweet now on the Twitter app, it goes like, are you sure you want to tweet this? Some of our users don't like tweets like this. They're going to do that similar, but it's going to go to like the next level. Like, you're going to be like messaging your girlfriend on like a WhatsApp or something. <laughs> and it's going to yeah. be like, are you sure you want to say this? We're going to log this because this seems like an aggressive way to ask this question. Like, what the fuck? Like, lo- starting case file. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> It's going to get darker. It's going to get mad dark. So anyway, yeah, to bring it all back. You see my point, though? Dude, I actually think people don't get it. It is a fucking blessing that when people are out of your life, you will start to forget about them and they will beca- they will decrease in importance. That's a really good thing to have in life. Like, are you, I know it can be good sometimes to remind yourself with a photograph, etc., but I think it can become like a fucked up emotional crutch, in my opinion. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Just move on. Nine times out of ten. All right. Santiago Lafarga. How much impact do you think the Carlos situation had on G2's underperformance at the RMR? This is the, I mean, this is the second time we've had this kind of question. I thought it mattered. In the show. I thought it mattered. But I, I don't think it mattered, but maybe, I mean, again, in terms of just n- knowing what kind of team you are or what your vision is, maybe he contributed in some way, shape, or form. I mean, I know that in the interviews they said that it didn't and that, that, that it had almost no impact on them. So maybe they weren't in contact with uh, with Carlos on the day. I would like- say the bigger impact to me is more like what's going to happen in the future. It's more like yeah. what happens now with these moves. I think that would have been heavily influenced by him. I don't think that they are a mad mad in that sense, no. No, I, would, uh, I wouldn't think so either. Uh, I don't think Carlos is that involved on the day to day with the CSGO team. He's probably thinking like, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to change in this team? He's thinking bigger win? picture, exactly. Yes, but uh, he's not. He's probably not there holding their hands. No, know? no. But uh, that's the that's the last question. So uh, short on the questions tonight. But thanks again for those who submitted questions, and be sure to submit questions next week if you got some. Uh, get ahead. You know, you got all the week. You know, to to, to get in. And um, yeah, be sure to leave a like and a you know like and a comment and all that. I'm checking the comments out. And I'll answer the questions uh, in there if you have any. And uh, yeah, Thorn, thanks so much for another show, my dude. Uh, well, I mean, we'll, oh yeah, reminder, we'll be here on Sunday uh, watching the finals together, esportsbet.io, putting it together. Uh, the first map will be on that website, on uh, their, uh, well, be streamed on Twitch, and then yes. we'll be switching over to Discord. So yes. I suppose we'll see you then. And uh, if we don't see you then, we'll see you next week. Peace. Chris is Still very much in the round. Oh, Chris! He's found three! It's down to a two-on-two!